Welcome to this Vibe API in 5 hours course. In this course, we're going to cover every aspect of Vibe API. In the first section, we're going to learn about what and why. So what is Vibe API? Why we need Vibe API? We're going to have a lot of quizzes and practices in almost every section. In the next section, we're going to lay the foundation by designing a Web API framework from scratch. We're going to learn about the theory, and we're actually going to implement it as well. And in section three, we're going to learn about REST API design. Next section, we're going to learn about the basics of ASP9 Core so that we can get started with building Web API. With section five, we're learning about how a HTTP request is routed to our Web API endpoint, followed by learning how data within the HTTP request is bound to our endpoint and how the data is validated in the next section. In section number eight, we're learning about filter pipeline that will help us to process the data before our web API actually executes. And in the next section, we're gonna working on creating those endpoints that support our application. In section number nine, we're gonna work on creating the endpoints that implements the functionalities and supports the data that we need in this course. In this course, I not only cover the steps of the implementations, but also the reasoning behind everything. And I will also include architectures and best practices. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what is Web API. So about a decade ago, when we created applications, we usually create monolithic applications, meaning that the application is a whole thing that is either deployed on the client side or on the server side, even though the application itself may have different parts within it. But as technologies evolve, Nowadays, we have different devices. We have cell phones, we have traditional browsers, and we may have TV, smart TV. We may have smart watches, and we may have any other type of IoT devices. So in this case, we don't want to deploy the whole big applications into different devices because different devices may require different type of technologies to create different type of applications. So therefore, there was a need to break the whole application into different parts. And some of those parts can be deployed to different devices. And these parts here are dependencies of the parts that are deployed to the devices. But these parts need to expose function calls so that the functionalities can be reused by the parts or pieces that are deployed into the devices. And because of this structure, these parts here are usually hosted on different servers. They're hosted on different servers. So then we call these exposed functions Web API. Certainly there are different ways to expose APIs, but Web API is the most popular way to expose either functionalities or data. But why is it called Web API? Let's break it down. So this part API stands for Application Program Interface. It is nothing more than a bunch of different functions here. And when these functions are hosted remotely and being called remotely, and the communication protocol is HTTP, then in this case, we usually call it Web API. These APIs becomes Web API. So you can consider Web API is just remotely hosted functions that communicates over HTTP protocol. When we create monolithic applications, the, one of the most popular architecture is layered architecture or the entire layered architecture where we usually have three different layers. And the top one is our user interface. And the user interface depends on the business logic layer. And the business logic layer, it depends on uh, our data access layer. So when we break this monolithic app into different parts, naturally, we can break these into three different parts. The UI part, business logic part, and the data access part. And when we 
use Web API to wrap around the data access layer, then our Web API is used to share data. So sharing data is one of the main purpose of having Web API. Then with Web API sharing the data, then the business logic layer can talk to the Web API and the UI layer can still talk to the business logic part, right? They can be together and deployed to different devices or can be separate. The good thing about this is that the data is now separated out of the monolithic application. And if you have another application that depends on the same data, then you can access the same web API without rewriting the code. Another way to break a monolithic application is to separate from here. So what that does is that your business logic layer here is still dependent on your data access layer, but you will have your web API wrap around the business logic layer, right? And what that does is that the web API is sharing functionalities or is sharing the business logic. So when should we choose to use web API to wrap around the business logic layer to share functionalities? And when should we choose to use Web API to wrap around the data, data access layer to share data? If you are a development company or a product company that you create product or services and your product or services needs to run on different devices, then it's better to use Web API to share functionalities. That way you can have different devices. And the only thing need to be deployed to these devices are the UI part. And each one of those devices can contact the web API for functionalities. Because in this case, if you were to create applications and have both the UI and the business logic layer deployed inside the device, that means for different devices, you would need to rewrite the business logic layer as well as the UI layer because this can be Apple and this can be Android or perhaps something else in the future. But this approach where we are using Web API to wrap around the business logic layer and have this hosted on a server, then the only thing you need to create for different type of devices are the UI layer. You can always reuse the same functionalities that is being exposed by Web APIs and hosted on a remote server. But if you are a data company or a company that has some data that needs to be shared, so as opposed to having functionalities needs to be shared, then in this case, you want to have data access layer and have your Web API wrap around the data access layer. There the clients would be able to use your data. In this video, let's talk about what makes a web API a RESTful API. So let's go to this restfulapi.net. Uh, we can see that the if you want to consider your web API a RESTful API, uh, then you have to follow the sixth guiding constraint, right? Which must be satisfied if an interface needs to be referred as RESTful. Uh, one of them, see there are six constraints, right? One of them is optional. But before we go into these six constraints, I wanted to point out that this RESTful API is really having the first stereo, which is sharing data in mind. Right? And that's the most case, most most cases when you need to create an API, you're actually sharing data. Why do I say so, right? If you look at the first one, the client and server, the constraint, if you read the first sentence, you can see that by separating the user interface concerns from the data storage concerns, we improve the portability of the user interface across multiple platforms and improve the scalability by simplifying the server components, right? So they are exp 
backing, you have API serving the data, right? So since we have already started talking about the first one, let's continue with the first one, right? The client and server, this is not referring to the client and server architecture, like in the later 90s. This is really referring to that you would have uh, a separate client and a separate server uh, so that they are independent on each other, right? So don't create a web API that is within your uh, SP.NET Core application. You can actually do that, right? Because the SP.NET Core uh, platform is a server-side platform, so you can actually create a, for example, your MVC for UI layer, you can also, in the same project, you also host a web API. So that's the case, it's gonna work for you, but you're not satisfying the first constraint, right? Stateless, this is kind of obvious because web API is based on HTTP protocol and HTTP protocol is stateless. So your web API is gonna be cacheable, you can definitely choose to cache a uh, HTTP response if you want to, but this is really for loading data, for reading data. And uniform interface, this is actually probably the most important thing that you have to satisfy, and we'll go into this later. Uniform interface uh, refers to that you have a consistent naming convention of your API endpoints. And when I say API endpoints, I mean those, those functions that you're hosting remotely, right? Each function is a endpoint. In the web API realm, we're referring to each function as a endpoint. We need to make sure the naming conventions of the endpoints are consistent so that when you are trying to retrieve or manipulate underlying resources, you know which URL to hit. The layered system, of course, you are going to have layered systems. This is uh, a most common architecture. The code on demand is really optional. You can read this. This is it. This is uh, the six guiding constraints, right? If you are sharing data, you should strive to satisfy at least the uniform interface. If you are sharing functionality, if you are creating Web API to share functionalities, most likely you won't be able to have very consistent user interface, which is fine because when you choose to share functionalities, those functionalities are mainly used internally for your own developers. Uh, in those cases, your naming of your API endpoints may not have to be so strict, right? Uh, as long as your own developers know which endpoint to hit in order to achieve certain functionalities, then that's fine. This is the introduction video of the second section. In this section, we're gonna take on a journey to design a framework, a web API framework from scratch. And the reason why I wanna do this is I think by designing a framework from scratch, we will know why we need a framework in the first place. Right, and this will actually not only help you to understand how ASP.NET Core platform works in terms of creating web API, it will help you to understand other frameworks as well if you were to take on those frameworks like Spring for Java or Node.js. We'll start from the next lesson. Let's start with figuring out the requirements for the web API framework. I think everybody come to this, you have created functions either with C-sharp or with other languages. Yeah, I would expect you to be able to create functions. Okay, so let's imagine we have some functions, right? Functions are simply taking parameters and return values. So a function one, a function two, and I will have function n. Right, and that's gonna be like dot, dot, dot. But these functions, 
needs to be remotely hosted. Here comes some limitations because we are not only writing functions within your programming language. We are creating functions and these functions have to be hosted remotely and users of these functions, which are mostly other programs, will need to communicate with your functions through the HTTP protocol, right? So we have a HTTP protocol limitation here. So it has to be communicated through the HTTP protocol. And in order to make these functions restful, we have to use these functions to share data. Like I mentioned in the last lesson, within the first section, they have to share data instead of sharing functionalities, right? So we're sharing data. So then what comes to mind first is that HTTP protocol goes through a certain port and all of the messages go through that same port. How can users of these functions call different functions through that single port, right? So that is routing. Routing is routing the HTTP request to different functions. In other words, uh, letting user trigger the functions that they want to trigger instead of not knowing which function to trigger, right? So that's the, the first requirement, which is routing. Find the letting HTTP request trigger corresponding functions, right? That's the first, that would be the first requirement. Secondly, for functions to take care of the data, right? Let's see, what are the data operations? The typical four data operations are creating data, rating data, updating data, and deleting data, right? So those are the CRUD options. Then our functions need to be able to complete those four different operations. So the second requirement is operations, right? Our functions need to complete the CRUD operations against the data store. So as we can see that the first requirement is to deal with the limitation of communicating through the HTTP protocol. And the second requirement is to deal with the limitation that uh, our functions need to share data or share resources from within data store. While web APIs in general don't have to share data only, they can share functionalities. But this is the requirement that we give to ourselves because we want our web APIs to be restful, right? So that's why we need to share data and we need to satisfy the second requirements, which is to be able to complete the CRUD operations against a data store, right? So these two are the most basic requirements we need to satisfy. In this video, we're going to design our Web API framework from high level, which is going to be a architectural design, right? So we have the two requirements that we identified from the previous video. We have routing and we have the CRUD operations, right? So first we need to get the, we have, we, our framework will need to receive the HTTP request. And for that, we need to have a, so if this is the, uh, a port in our operating system that receives the HTTP request, right? So this is the port, then we will need a service that runs constantly and we can use a console application, for example, or a windows service. The simplest way would be using a console application to, um, to do that. We need this service to run constantly and listen, listen to the port. And when there's a message comes from the port to the service, then the service will receive the HTTP request. So if the HTTP request is in the text format, the service need to convert that to class object, right? To a class object so that we can access all of the 
metadata or all of the information from that HTTP request. So what should the service do? The first thing the service needs to do is to listen to the port. And after that, the service need to parse or need to understand the HTTP request and package the info in a object. Now that we have the information in an object, we can look into the object and try to understand which function we need to call. By the way, in Web API terminology, we're referring to each one of these functions, each one of these functions as endpoints. Okay, so I would use the endpoint terminology where I actually refer to these functions. Right? So once at the second step, we know what's in the HTTP request by accessing the, the object. Now that we have that information, we need to determine which function to call, right? Determine the, the endpoint to hit. And after that, we're simply just hitting the, the functions, calling these functions, right? And the easiest way to provide the parameter is to just provide the HTTP request object, right? So then the fourth step is just calling the, the endpoint, one endpoint, the endpoint that we found, right? Calling the endpoint and provide the HTTP request object as a parameter, right? This is the simplest way to provide, to provide a parameter. May not be the most elegant way to do it. All right, so I have just rearranged the diagrams and the four points that we have just uh, figured out. And this makes the whole thing makes more sense. So we have the port and we have the service here that is listening to it. Um, might need to put a text box here saying this is the service that is supposed to run all the time and listen to the port. And then when the port has a message, it will go into the service and the service will receive the message and you know, kind of parse the message, package the information in the object, and then it will determine which endpoint to hit, right? And once determined, then it will call that endpoint. So suppose instead of calling, I should say call, just to be consistent of all of the verbs. Uh, so call the endpoint and provide the HTTP request object as a parameter. These functions, when they receive the parameter, then of course they have to look into the object and get the information that they need. So those are for the, the first requirement. What about the second requirement, the CRUD operations? Of course, that very apparently belong to the functions. So the functions has to be, you know, have to do certain things like create resources, right? Create data, uh, read data and uh, update data and let's add another one here we'll just say delete data right and then I'm gonna have this one I'm gonna have this one connect to here too so then uh, another question arise arises which is how does the service map the request like how does the service determine the endpoint which endpoint to hit right um, that's that the server has to obviously look at the, the message, the HTTP request, and determine which endpoint to hit. And within HTTP request, we have the URI, right? And we have HTTP header uh, that contains the metadata. We have the HTTP verbs. And fortunately, the verbs actually corresponds to these four operations very well, right? So the get verb can corresponds to the read operation. The, the put or the patch word can corresponds to the update. And the delete verb can obviously correspond to the delete. And the uh, post verb 
and corresponds to create. So let's draw that on this architectural design so that we are clear the correspondence, right? So we have HTTP post that is, you know, corresponds to create and HTTP get corresponds to read and either put or patch corresponds to update and we have the HTTP delete corresponds to delete. Then with the combination of the verbs as well as the URI, our service should be able to find the endpoint to hit. All right, so this is a very simplified architectural design that will help us with designing the web API framework. All right, basically these are the things, right? These are the things that we need to do for the framework to help developers to achieve what the developers want to achieve, which is sharing the data and manipulating the data. All right, so in this video, we're gonna create a framework from scratch by using the design that we came up with from the previous video. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're not going to create a framework from scratch. Instead, we're gonna use Node.js uh, and Express framework. The Express framework is a very thin framework that I can use to demonstrate to you that uh, the minimal functionalities that a framework needs to have in order to in order to help developer to focus on a developer's job to share data. All right, so let's get started. So I, I'm going to this is Windows uh, Windows 10. So I'm going to go to uh, here and uh, I'm going to right click on Command. I'm going to run as administrator. Right run the command prompt as administrator. And before that, you do need to install Node.js. Go to uh, node.js.org and then download the LTS version and just double click on it and run it and you will have Node.js installed. And coming back and just go to the directory that you want to create this uh, project. Right, I'm going to go to my directory and I'm gonna create a new directory. I'm gonna call it uh, the Express Framework, right? And uh, I'm gonna CD into it. And from here, I am going to run APM in it. And this is the reason why you wanna run it as administrator because if you don't, then the NPM init may not work. So hit enter and then you just hit enter. Learn until you have your package.json. Right. If you don't have package.json, uh, that probably means you didn't run it as administrator. And from here, I'm going to do code dot. So this is running Visual Studio Code. If you don't have it, then you can choose to use Notepad, right? Or Notepad plus plus or any editor. By the way, we're using Visual Studio Code, but don't worry, we are not going to use Visual Studio Code when we start actually developing web API on SP.NET Core platform. I'm only using Visual Studio Code uh, to demonstrate with Node.js uh, because Visual Studio Code is a better IDE when you work with JavaScript, in my own opinion. So I'm gonna run Node, uh, sorry, Visual Studio Code. And then I'm going to go over here and in here, I'm gonna change this task to start and I'm going to change this part to node.app.js. So node.mon is a is, is a package that can help us to can help us to enable the hot reload. So if we change anything, it will automatically reload the program. So I'm going to save it, and then the next thing I need to do is I go back to my console, and I'm going to run. Uh, npm install. So this will install all of the dependencies based on the package.json. Right. So let me just go back and make sure that I saved the package.json. Okay, so I'm going to run npm install uh, and specifically I want express to be there and then have a space and I want node.mon as well. Right. Now hit enter and, and we'll start installing all the dependencies, all of the NPM packages that, uh, that we need. All right, so let's have a look. So we have node modules and we have the packages. So going back to uh, 
going back to here, right? So we're gonna create, uh, let's, let's take a look. We have app.js, app which we haven't actually uh, created yet. So we are going to go over here and click on this and we're gonna call it app.js, right? And from here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna import uh, express, right? By just call require express, right? So now we have express as a reference Next thing is we're gonna create a service. Remember the service that we wanna create. Going back to the diagram, uh, we need to have a service that runs all the time and listen to a port, right? So here, that's exactly what we are going to do next. We are going to actually declare the service. And what is the service? It's the express will give us the service, right? Express has that, uh, is a framework, right? So this service is going to listen, sorry, I spelled, let I have a typo here. So I'm gonna have this service listen to the port I wanted to listen. That's for example, 3000. And this function, this arrow function will tell the service to say, once you start listening, uh, you need to do something, right? So here we just simply output to say that, you know, the service is listening to uh, port 3000 that's it okay and after that we are going to configure the service to do the CRUD operations right the create the update sorry the create the read the update and the delete right for uh we're going to tell the service to rot right remember we're going back again to this diagram, the, the next thing we need to do is we need to understand the HTTP request and uh, uh, package that information into an object, which Express does that automatically, right? And then here we're gonna determine the endpoints to hit. And that's what we are gonna do now. We're going to tell that, remember the way to determine it is to use a combination between the, the URI in the HTTP request, as well as the, the verb, right? So this part is the verb. The get corresponds to read. So let's do the get first, because that's the simplest, right? So we're, we're gonna have get, and uh, let's imagine we're creating a ticketing system, or, or uh, let's say it's a, a bug tracker, right? So in bug tracker, we're gonna create tickets. So, so we are gonna list I'm gonna read all of the tickets through this endpoints. So this endpoints would be uh, HTTP localhost 3000 slash tickets. And then the, uh, the request from the endpoint will be passed in. You can see that it's even giving me the intelligence, IntelliSense, right? And this is the, uh, on the second step where we have the service understand the HTTP request and package the information in an object, right? That RES parameter is, is the object, right? So Express Framework already did this step, right? And the RES object is this object that contains all of the information that our functions can use uh, to retrieve the information from the HTTP request. And this response object is going to be the response that we can use to, to pass back the HTTP response. So after that, uh, this is gonna be an arrow function as well. And then uh, here basically saying that if the ticket is, sorry, if the uh, URI is slash tickets, and if it's a get method, HTTP get, which corresponds to the read operation. Then we're gonna read, we're gonna return all of the tickets. But now I don't have the tickets, right? I'm just going to uh, send information by saying uh, I'm reading uh, the tickets, right? That's it, that's all I wanna do. And the next one, I want to retrieve a particular ticket. So I'm gonna copy this and I am going to modify the rod a little bit to say I want to provide a ticket, right? And then here, I am going to receive 
So this is JavaScript, very similar to C Sharp, right? Although we are going to talk about C Sharp based on ASP.NET Core platform, but I'm gonna use this Express uh, framework to help us to understand the minimum required functionalities that a framework uh, will have, and then it will help us to understand the ASP.NET Core platform, uh, the, the, the web for helping us creating APIs, right? So, so we're gonna re uh, uh, receive the ID from uh, the parameters, right? From the URL. So this, this would correspond to this, right? So we're reading a particular ticket. So which ticket are we reading? We are reading the, uh, sorry, the ID. And so instead of using double quote, I'm gonna use this in order to do a string interpolation. So, so basically we're saying this, if it's a get request, and if the what is this, that means we're trying to read a particular ticket. And we're gonna, in the response, we're gonna send back this message and saying ring ticket and the ticket number, right? So that's that. And then next one, is we are going to do a um, we're going to do a create the create operation corresponds to the HTTP post right and then we're going to post to the same URI but with a different verb right and then here we're going to just simply say that we are creating tickets uh, creating a ticket right of course that information also comes from the request right the the, the uh, information about this particular ticket that we want to create will be within the request right but we have to do something here in order to get it right but but for now i'm not going to do anything i'm just going to send a message back to say that we are creating a ticket and now we are going to use the http put uh, in order to to say we are updating a ticket and last but not least, we are going to use HTTP delete. All right, we are going to hit the same endpoint and again with the ID. We're deleting which ticket? This ticket that comes from the ID. And we are actually going to copy this code, actually copy all of them and replace this line. And I'm gonna re receive the ID from here. And then I'm gonna say deleting ticket. Let's recap that we're trying to configure Node.js uh, and Express to, to be able to determine which endpoint to hit, right? And by using this Express example, we can see that we're using a combination of the endpoint's URL and the HTTP verb, right? to be able to point to different operations, right? We have uh, this URL and the get verb points to the, the read operation, right? We have two type of read operations with two different URL, right? So this is a read operation and this is another read operation, right? Uh, and we were using the get verb to target that. And then for the create operation, we're using the post, we're using the post verb and the same URL, same with the update operation. We're using the same URL with the put verb. And then we're using the delete, uh, using the delete verb along with this URL, which is happen to be the same as this um, reading a particular ticket, right? But the verb is different. So this will target the delete operation. So if we were to implement a web API framework, then we should implement similar strategies to do with routing. In this video, we're gonna test all of the endpoints that we have created Let's go to our console where we have run it as an administrator. Now we're gonna do npm start. And then we're gonna watch that says the service is listening to port 3000, which is the message that we wrote, right? We wrote it over here. The service is listening to port 3000, right? 
Now we can use browser to test the get, but we can't use the browser to test the uh, the put and the delete and the post. But but let's test with browser first. Okay, let's go here, open up another tab, and then we'll go to three thousand and we're gonna tickets. And it returns us reading tickets. Cool, right? And if I have this, then it will be retrieving a particular ticket. So it's gonna say reading ticket 1,200, right? And if we change to this, it give us 1,201. Now we need to test the post and the put and the delete. So for that, we can use um, a PowerShell. So we're gonna use PowerShell and uh, we can use the PowerShell ISE. And ISE is, is like integrated uh, development environment IDE, right? So this is an integrated scripting environment. So let's just open it up and it's showing on my the other window. Oh, actually it's showing here. All right, so let's click on this new script. So it's gonna give us an entitled a PowerShell script, right? And what do we want to do? We want to invoke a REST method. You can actually, from the right hand side, you can say, you know, REST, REST method. See, it says invoke REST method. So we can just type it out. We can say invoke REST method. It has IntelliSense and I tell it the URI is HTTP uh, local host. 3000 and tickets uh, let's and method is let's do the get as well right and uh, uh, we'll have a variable to receive so this dollar sign is a variable it defines a variable so we're going to receive the uh, the result and we're going to run it right. it looks like it did nothing but if it actually did something and it's stored inside this variable and you can retrieve it later. So run selection, right? I selected this and then I click on run selection. Then it will give me this result, which is reading tickets. See this here, reading tickets. Cool, right? So now I will have uh, the get a particular ticket. Uh, we are going to get ticket one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And then if I select this whole thing, I run selection and then I examine what's in the response. It's telling me rating ticket one, two, three, four, five, right? That's exactly what we want. And then we're going to try to test the, the post method, which is creating ticket, right? And that's this URI. And with this combination, we're hitting that post uh, method there. Right, so again, we're host, we selecting this and then run it. And then we examine, examine this one by hitting F8 or clicking on here. Then it's telling us we're creating a ticket, right? Uh, now I'm just going to do both put as well as delete. And here I'm going to say we're deleting the same ticket here, right? So if I do, do it this way, then uh, examine the response. We know it's updating a ticket as expected, right? Right over here, right? And then delete ticket again. Uh, we are going to see it right now. All right, so we're deleting a ticket. So there we have it, a very simple framework that we, we can use to write API. Then this video, we're gonna talk about what's missing then in this type of implementation of the framework, right? The Web API framework. Imagine this is the framework that you built yourself, right? And it's simple and convenient with a few lines of code. You have a web API running, right? And it does the routing. It knows where, which endpoint to hit. And uh, yeah, and it returns the result back to the caller. But the problem with this approach, with this implementation or this design is that we're missing a lot of things in the pipeline, right? Imagine the, the message goes through a pipeline and each pipeline has uh, one or many different, uh, different processors to process the, the message. Each processor uh, does different jobs, 
right? So this goes through each processor one by one until it finishes. So, so in this pipeline, uh, we have many missing steps. The only thing it did is really is that it, uh, it, uh, it knows which endpoint to hit, right? So what's missing? Let's identify what's missing in this video. So after routing, we need to know whether actually the user can access this endpoint or not, right? So that's authorization. So authorization is missing, first of all. Secondly, uh, so let's use the next method, right? Use this as example. Secondly, uh, I have to go into the request object to get the ID out. But what if I just want an ID from here, right? My method, my remotely hosted functions takes a ID. And that's it, I don't need, need it to take anything else. Why do I have to deal with this request object which contains lots of information, which contains all the information that belongs to the HTTP request? I only need the ID, right? So that's called model binding, right? So model binding is basically takes the request object and take only the information I need. For example, this this ID. And and if we if we call this as a model, then when we bind the request to the model, that's called model binding. And sometimes this is going to be a class, right? For example, this is going to be a a product class, right? And then your information from the HTTP request. When it binds to this object, then that's called model binding, right? Authorization, model binding, and after that, once you have, once you have the the uh, the parameter comes in, right? Uh, what should you do? You should do validation. You you should validate whether this is uh, correct or not. For example, this is supposed to be an integer, but now it's a string, right? So we need to validate whether the ID actually contains the correct information, whether it's an integer, whether it's greater than zero, uh, whether it's which is too big or too small, uh, whether it's, it's, uh, it's a decimal or not. So all those things needs to be validated. And especially when you have a object and contains a significant amount of information and you do need to uh, be very careful validating it because you are having a function that is exposed to the whole internet, everybody can access it, uh, provided that they have authorization, they have author authorized. Um, so anything that user provides you cannot be trusted, right? You don't know whether they intentionally make, trying to attack your endpoint, or it's a user uh, unintentionally made a mistake Either way, you have to validate it, and then that's called model uh, validation, right? So, and then um, what about versioning, right? So that's even probably before uh, authorization. So what about versioning, right? You have endpoints, and over the time, you want to provide different versions to your endpoints so that uh, you can actually host different versions at the same time as you are retiring older versions, you, you don't actually just cut it off. So older clients uh, of you won't be able to access it anymore. So you may be you may need to host a different version and slowly retire those older versions. So versioning is also very important. Um, and also things like exception handling, of course, you can do every everything inside inside the function, probably not the versioning. Um, uh, you, even even versioning you can you can do it right here right so uh, you can do everything here exception handling as well and also uh, the result formatting all of these and perhaps even more than that I'm just uh, having some uh, basic aspects of what you need to do inside the function but actually what a developer need to focus on is in this case getting the ticket from where? From the from a data store, for example. And that's what you need to focus on. The developer don't have to worry about all of these. If the framework can provide all these functionalities, then that would be that that would be very helpful for the developer. 
in order to, for them, for the developers to focus their attention on the thing that they need to focus on, which is the business logic, the um, retrieving data. Those are the things that the framework should help, right? Of course, model validation, the, use, the developer has to provide the logic about how to validate the data, right? Uh, but a lot of things should be automatic. So in this lesson, I just want to uh, kind of spell out all of the aspects that a framework should also uh, have. And then um, once we go into the ASP.NET Core thing, we, we will see uh, how ASP.NET Core actually uh, handles all of these. In this video, we're going to talk about Web API design. And we're specifically going to talk about one of the guiding constraints, which is uniform interface. And because we're trying to comply with the RESTful API uh, 6 architecture constraints, so like I, like I said before, we're only dealing with using Web API to expose data right to share data to allow the users of the api to manipulate data as well in this case we're only dealing with the crowd operations mainly dealing with the crowd operations so uh, let's see how we can design the routing template right basically the uri so that they are consistent and they're uniform so let's say we're dealing with a, a e-commerce application Right. In this case, uh, we have products and each product may have categories, right? Or, or we can say each category may have lots of products, right? And each product belongs to a category. So let's use this example to talk about the uniform interface. And if we are dealing with products, right? So let's talk about this first and let's talk about products for create. Right, which is the HTTP verb post. Then one of the things that most developers follow for making a consistent URI is instead of using verbs, most developers agree to use nouns, right? Because we already have the HTTP verbs. So it makes sense to use nouns in this case. So we, we have API and we're dealing with products, right? So in this case, um, we use you know, products, right? And that's it. Because as long as we know what the verb is and we have this as the URI, we know we are creating a product. So that's create. And what about read? Right? Read is the get HTTP verb. So in this case, again, we're going to have API slash products it will be always products because we're dealing with products so we're going to say products then this tells us this combination of products and get right this tells us we're reading all of the products and what if we want to read a particular product right read one product uh, again we're using get and we should design our uh, raw template to be products but with a parameter, with ID parameter, like that, right? And uh, now we're going on to update, right? Update, we can use put or we can use patch, right? In this case, we still use products, right? Because we want it to be consistent. And uh, uh, so that's it. We use this product. Uh, we're demonstrated in that uh, Node.js video. Uh, but we're going to go a little deeper than that. So we have update, uh, have the HTTP put and the products brought, then we know we are updating. And what if we want to uh, delete, right? Again, we have the delete key verb, uh, the HTTP verb, and we have API slash products, and that's it. So then let's take uh, the category, for example. Right. Obviously, if we want to do category, right, let's remove, let's remove all of these so that we can see exactly what we have. All right. So we have this set of your URIs, right? And if we're dealing with a category, 
then we're replacing all of the products with categories like that. And that's it. Okay, probably it's better to change all of this to lowercase. But what if I want, so after this read, I want to read all of the product that belong to a certain category. What do I do? Okay. So in that case, we would have categories, okay? And it's a certain category, so we have to use ID, okay? So for this category, and I need all of the products that belong to this category. Then I do slash, and then I do products, right? And if we want to go even further, and say, I want to see a particular product that belongs to a particular category, then in that case, we can do you know, category slash ID slash products slash ID slash ID again, right? As long as these are unique, then the framework knows which function to hit, right? Which endpoint to hit. To clean this up a little bit, I will delete all of the duplicates. So we basically have four different patterns, right? So you can follow this pattern to create your own CRUD operations. All right, practice time. So we're trying to design a uh, routing template for a e-commerce application. We need to deal with a e-commerce online shop that sells t-shirts. So t-shirt may have different colors and have different brands, right? First of all, it has uh, different brands and it can have different colors, can different sizes. So let's see, these are the required endpoints and you need to come up with the, the rots that can help the framework to determine which endpoint to hit, right? So we have a create, you need to create a t-shirt, right? Create a shirt, endpoint for create a shirt. You need an endpoint for rate all of the shirts and then another one for rating uh, a particular shirt. The next one is read a shirt that is of a particular size. The next one is read a shirt that is of particular color and a particular size. Okay. And then update a shirt, sorry, and delete a shirt. These two are not that straightforward, right? Okay. So remember a shirt can have a different brand, okay, different color and different size. So for example, this one, I just want to give an example. Uh, so this one would be API uh, shirts. That's it, right? So go ahead and work on it. In the next video, uh, I'm going to show you my suggested answer. All right, let me try to show you the suggested answer. So for the create a shirt, this one is going to be simple. Uh, and I usually want to start the API what, right, with the API word. You don't have to have it, but this is my habit. So I have the API and then I'll do slash. And of course, this is going to be shirts, right? With the HTTP post verb along with this rod, right, we know which endpoint to hit. And then this read all shirts is going to be the same rod, right? But this is going to use the HTTP get verb. Then the framework will know which endpoint to hit. And this is reading a particular shirt, right? One shirt. So it will be the same rod along with a parameter here. So this in uh, ASP.NET Core, it's called the routing template. Right, so we have this routing template that matches, you know, when you provide this URL with, uh, with, a, with ID at the end, it matches this template, then it knows which endpoint to hit. Right? And this is a get key, uh, verb as well. And this one and the next one is, uh, they are going to be tricky because I use this to kind of trick you guys because you probably, uh, it, going to attempt to use this, but this is not going to be correct, right? If you do something like that, right? This is not going to be correct. Why? Because this part already 
refers to a unique record in the shirt's collection, right? The shirt's data store. Then we don't need the sizes anymore. So uh, remember I mentioned there's brands and their sizes and their colors and their shirts, right? So this one, uh, I would say we can use brands, right? You go to a store and you ask the, per the people in the store to get you uh, a shirt that is of this brand, right? You, you, you provide a brand name and then you tell them what the size you want, right? And they, they're, they're going to give you a list of shirts. They, they give you many shirts that have different colors. So this one will return you a list of shirts, right? But this one, right? Read a shirt that is of a particular color and a particular size. So this one is uh, similar to that. You would need to provide the brand name and uh, you need to provide a color. In this case, it's going to give you a unique shirt, right? Just single shirt, right? You provide the brand name, the color, and the size, right? The person in the store will be able to get go there and grab one, just single shirt for you, right? Although they may have different uh, copies, right? So there's different quantities, more than one quantity, right? So you, 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 but but they can still grab single one, and this is going to be the same updates. It's going to be the same same rot with a different verb, which is put or a patch, and delete will be uh, similar. Uh, you just need to provide the ID with the HTTP delete verb. So this these are the suggested answers, and if you have any questions. Uh, do not hesitate to ask in the QA area. I think it would be best to talk about the ASP.NET Core basics before we dive into each part of Web API, because Web API is based on the ASP.NET Core platform, which is the framework of our Web API. So in this video, let's talk about the basics of ASP.NET Core. So if we consider that the Web API framework as a black box, then at least we know that the framework needs to handle HTTP request and returns HTTP response, right? The request goes in, the framework does some magic and returns the HTTP response. So that makes Microsoft uh, adopt the production line, like this assembly line uh, methodology, right? So imagine you have a product that needs to be assembled. Then, and the product goes from left to the right. And you have each person specialize in a particular part of the assembly. Benefit of this is that each person does not need to master every part of the assembly, right? Each, each person can specialize in one skill and they can do their best related to that skill. So this uh, facilitates the production and makes the mass production possible. And because the way that message goes into our framework and goes out of framework is very similar to producing products. So it makes sense to consider the framework, or at least the, the instance of that framework when it runs as a service as, as a pipeline and the message would go into the pipeline and consider that each person as a, as, as a Microsoft call it middleware, right? Each person is a middleware and does a specific uh, work to process the request. And once this middleware is done and it passes the message to the next one, and then the next one, or until the last one finishes, and then it will return back the only thing that is different, a little bit different from production line is the production line doesn't go back to the same person. But here, because uh, each middleware is simply a function, that's why, you know, the previous function to call the next one. And when the last one returns, it simply returns back to the previous function, which is its color, right? So the response would go one by one until it goes out from the first one and, go, and goes 
out returns to the color of the web API. As usual in all my courses, as long as this is possible, I always want to add some uh, architectural and design uh, ideas into a in design pattern. This kind of architecture is very similar to a pattern that is called the chain of responsibilities. Right. So when you have an object and you have uh, you want to handle the objects in different ways. So you can uh, have that object pass through a chain of different handlers, right? the handler of that object. And each handler does different things to that object. Uh, the difference between this architecture and the, the chain of responsibility is that in the chain of responsibility, if you can, you can put a lot of handlers in there, but if the handler is not suitable for that object, then it will simply pass that object to the next one, to the next handler, right? Whereas in this um, middleware pipeline, the each middleware, as long as you configure the, the middle, middleware here, you put the middleware in the pipeline, the middleware will have to do something, where it is, is uh, expected to do something to the message. So if we take this diagram as an architectural design, and if we need to use code to implement this, then how would we do it? Uh, imagine that we have a, a framework, an instance of the framework, and we call it application, right? App. What we need to do is to imagine we are creating the framework and we can't make the framework use the same, always use the same set of middleware because the framework has to help developers to create all type of systems, software systems. So the framework has to be flexible enough for developers to configure different middlewares to use, right? So if the first one is not necessary, then we can remove that. We can allow the developers to remove that, right? And, and perhaps use a different one instead of the, the default one. Right, so let's use a different color to represent a different one. Right, so let's say that we use, let's say we use a, a different color to to represent, and, and this one instead of uh, the default one, we can use uh, again a different color. Right, and this one depends on our uh, requirement. Uh, we should use uh, the green one. So everything has to be config configurable, right? And if we talk about it in pseudo code, and if we have a app instance that refers to the framework, what should we do, right? And we can say app dot use you know, middleware one, right? And so this developers once developers gains uh, gain the instance of the framework, the the app, right? App then we can have methods like use this middleware and you know use use uh, use middleware uh, nine right and then use middleware twelve. We can allow the developers to use different middlewares, right? Uh, the thing about the middlewares is that the middlewares needs to depend on a lot of dependency classes. So how do we tell the middleware which class to use? So that, that means that before we, uh, we use the middleware, we have to uh, dependency inject the dependencies of, of the middleware, right? So for example, we can say app dot add uh, dependencies, right? And then we can say for, um, uh, for you know class class one, it uses the class one instance, right? And for class two, it uses class two instance. And uh, not only adding dependencies, we can also configure the middleware, the behavior of the of middleware. Let's say the first one is is authorization. It's for for authorize users, right? There are different type of authorizations. So you can configure the middleware uh, behave differently. Let's say we are uh, configuring, um, so uh, we can say 
you know, configure, configure uh, authorization. I'm not writing code exactly the same as uh, as ASP.NET ASP core platform. I'm just using um, pseudo code, right? Basically to to show you the concept. So we can configure the authorization uh, middleware, and and then we can provide a bunch of parameters inside, right? To tell how the authorization should work. Should it use cookie authentication? Should it use uh, tokens, right? There's different behavior you can you can use, right? So this is the basic to, basic things, right? So you would configure, you would add dependencies. This is the three different things your framework need to have. So first we need to, you know, add, add dependencies, right? And then secondly, you need to add uh, middleware, right? And thirdly, you need to configure how your middleware, middleware behave. Is that right? Behave, right? Um, the reason why this has to be called first is uh, it's just it just makes sense that you configure the behavior behavior and before you actually triggering it, right? So this is the uh, very basics of ASP.NET Core, and we're gonna look at how it works by creating a simple ASP.NET Core application. In this video, let's see how ASP.NET Core platform works by looking at the code, right? Uh, so this is Visual Studio 2019 Community Edition, right? You can see it's the Community Edition that it's free and you can download uh, the latest, latest version. So what I would do is I'm going to go to File, New, and I'll create a new project. And what I will create is a ASP.NET Core web application, right? So what you can do is uh, you can put web app here and then you're going to see this uh, come up and find the ASP.NET Core web application and click on next and then uh, just give it, a, give it a name, right? So this is the web API course and the project name is uh, platform demo and I'll click on the create button now and select the empty one since uh, we want to use the empty solution so that we can learn everything from scratch and click on create the uh, ASP.NET 5 already came out uh, there are some enhancements to web API part uh, but the basic part about ASP.NET Core platform is uh, remains the same. So let's see how this works. So the everything starts from program.cs, and if you look at it, it's actually it's actually a console application. I would expect you have already created many console applications for for your practice, so you know exactly what this is. This is a console application that runs in an infinite loop, right? It always runs. So it basically runs as a service. Why is a console application? Because um, in IIS, like the Internet Information Service um, or Internet Information Server, it used to be a Windows service, but because Microsoft wanted to have a cross-platform web server, Right, so they created this ASP.NET Core based on um, Castro server, and the Castro server is actually is a console application that can run as a console application in Windows and then terminal applications in other platforms. So <clears throat> here we have this main method, which is the entry point, right? And then this uh, it, it creates a host, right? This host it represents the service that runs constantly, right? And all it does here is try to build that host, right? So how does it create the host? It's here, it, it configures the host. And then we go inside it, you will see that it's try to 
configure all of the uh, middleware and it's configure the uh, it asks the middleware and configure the middleware, right? And only after that is uh, configuration is done, right? So this part goes first, and then it will build the server, right? And then it will it will run, right? So only after all of these are done does it go to call the run method, and then it will run in an infinite loop, listen to a specific port for the HTTP request to come in and it will process it uh, with the middleware that you configure. So where do we configure the middleware, right? It's here, look at this class. It actually exists as a file here, right? So use this to configure. And here we have two methods. This part is the one that we demonstrated uh, here. So the configure services covers these two parts and then the the configure method is basically where you configure the pipeline, right? And the configure services is you're configuring all of the dependencies and you configure how your middleware should behave. So I'm talking about these two methods here. You have this configure method and the configure services method, right? So this one contains all of the middleware that you want to add to the pipeline at this one configures other dependencies and configures the behavior of the middleware, right? And we have some uh, default middleware already, right? We have this developer exception page uh, where it will show a uh, exception, a page, if it's development environment, right? And then by default, it will have to do routing. Otherwise, it doesn't know which endpoint to hit, right? Which function to call. So routing is must. That you will always see the routing here, even when you create this empty uh, project, right? And we have talked about this. This is uh, the absolutely necessary part in the uh, pipeline, right? And then uh, this is basically saying, hey, I have uh, I have these endpoints, right? So the endpoint middleware configures the endpoint, and and if if you think that the Node.js Express platform is super easy. Well, here it's actually super easy too, right? So you can actually uh, remember the tickets thing. So you, you, you can, uh, so tickets, you can implement the same thing here with the tickets and then you would, um, you would just return, you know, reading all the tickets. If you use it this way, it's probably not as easy as, as Express, where you can just uh, very easily get the ID from the context, right? Because here's context, context is basically a HTTP context where you can get the request object this way, but then you had to do a little bit of work to get the ID from the request, right? <clears throat> if, if we were to create another uh, endpoint to get the specific ticket, then you have to do a little bit of work to parse the request and get the ID and all those stuff, right? But in SPNet Core, there are much better ways to do the routing. So you're gonna see uh, how the routing works in future videos. So again, to recap that we have this configure method to configure all of the middlewares that you wanna use. and in, Remember there's a sequence, right? You have to put the uh, first middleware on the top and then second and then the third, you can add uh, as many middleware as necessary. And then you need to configure the dependencies inside the configure services, as well as uh, you need to configure each middleware, uh, how they should work, how they should behave. And um, of course, each middleware has a default uh, behavior. So if you don't need to configure a specific behavior, then you don't have to uh, configure a specific behavior. You just need to add the dependencies. And some of them don't need dependencies like this one. It, it doesn't need dependencies, right? So if, if you run this and it has a 404 error because we have changed our uh, routing here, right? The, rot, the rots is tickets. So the default rot doesn't return anything. So, it, but if I change it to this, then it reads all shows the message that I provided, right? So this is a very quick demo 
to show you how the basic ASP.NET Core platform works. In this video, we are going to learn Web API routing. So let's continue from the previous lesson. We can remove this, uh, this simple way of endpoint routing. Let's use endpoints.mapcontrollers, right? I'm going to code it right now and you can follow along. And then uh, after that, I will explain how this works, what it means by map controllers, right? So this is, you can consider this as a, uh, a middleware, right? And then we will, we know this is the middleware and how do we configure this middleware? We go over here and we add all of the dependencies that this map controller middleware uses. And how do we do that? We, we do this, uh, here's, a, here's a services collection, right? The services collection, basically, it's a collection of all of the dependencies. Uh, and uh, you can basically just say add controllers here. So it's actually very simple, right? So first step, add this map controllers endpoint, uh, uh, basically it's a middleware, and then you add the dependencies here. There's nothing to configure, right? No behaviors configured, there's be default behaviors, right? And then next thing we need to do is to create a controllers folder and then we'll add a controller and then we'll start talking about it, right? We can just uh, add a class instead of adding controller that way. So we are going to, let's use that tickets thing, right? So we have been using the ticket concept uh, as if we're creating a back, uh, back trigger application. Right, so we're gonna have a tickets controller. All right, and we need to derive this, uh, we need to use inheritance here, right? We need to derive this class from the controller uh, controller base class. And if I do control dot, you, you're gonna see this using Microsoft.ASP.NET core dot MVC, right? And another thing, we should do is we should use API controller right, this one to decorate the, the class so that we're saying this is a API controller. This is not a MVC controller, right? And this uh, controller base contains everything that you will need for creating a web API controller. Okay, so, so let's recap. So in first step, you add this map controllers. Second step, you configure, you add the dependencies. And then the third step is to create a controller and derive from controller base and decorate it with the API controller attribute, right? Those are the three steps you need in order to create a controller. But what is a controller? And what is MVC? Right, so we have this MVC interface. Well, basically, uh, MVC is a application framework based on ASP.NET Core platform. And Web API is based on MVC application framework. There isn't a just a, sing, a separate application framework for Web API. Web API is based on MVC framework. But I'm not going to talk too much about MVC because uh, you know, MVC stands for Model View Controller, but I'm not gonna talk too much about MVC because for Web API, we don't need the view. We only need the models and we need the controller, right? And the next, uh, next lessons, we're gonna talk about model bindings and model validations, those stuff, where you're gonna see uh, things related to models, but, for now, you can consider the controller is basically a class that groups together uh, related endpoints, right? Like that from the very beginning of this course, we have talked about Web APIs are nothing uh, but a whole bunch of functions that are hosted remotely, right? So the controller class is basically a class that contains related functions. Right, so how's it related? Because every method down here is related to tickets, right? So 
let's say if we were to have projects for the tickets to be related to, then you would have another controller class and we would call it projects controller. And that projects controller will or contains everything, like all of the functions that will be hosted remotely, but is related to project. All right, let's focus on routing because we are talking about routing in this video, all right? So let's create the same routes that we created in the Express uh, demo, right? Node.js Express demo. So uh, it's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, so let's create the first one, which is the get all of the tickets, right? We need a method and we need a return action results. So act because we are using MVC controller and MVC controller uh, can return all type of data, right? Even Web API can return, JSON can return, um, XML can return anything. The six guiding constraints didn't mention what the result should be, right? So that's why we need a generic a return type and the I action result can return uh, all of that. So you can just have one return type that contains everything, right? So we can have uh, action result and then we can say get. So we return all the tickets in this case. So first of all, uh, and for, for achieve, to achieve that, we can use the uh, attributes, right? So, and this is called attribute routing. Uh, first of all, what is the HTTP verb? For, of course, this one is HTTP get, right? Uh, and then here it's attribute routing. So we're using this, this is called attribute in C sharp, right? And I'm pretty sure you know that. And uh, we're going to have, we just need to specify the routes here. I'm going to say API slash. And what is, uh, what is it? What is the, so it's going to be tickets, right? So this is going to return us all of the tickets. And as we have demonstrated uh, earlier, we are in this video, we're not going to actually return, um, like create all of the tickets. I'm going to have it return. Um, <clears throat> well, another thing I want to mention here is the, uh, it's, after all, it's a HTTP response needs to go back, right? And the HTTP response has a different num uh, status code. There's 200, which is okay, right? Like everything is okay, then we return 200. If the request is a bad request, then we return the 400 series, right? Which indicates a user error. And if it's a server error, we return the 500 series, right? for example. And if it's an authorization failure, then it's also the 400 series, right? Four, 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 three, forbidden, for example. So in this case, we're just returning a string. We're gonna say, you know, reading all the tickets, right? So that's uh, gonna create, create all of that. Uh, so this one is going to be return a particular one. So we're gonna put a raw template. This is called a template, right? And the raw template says ID, so we're gonna have an ID here. So this one corresponds to this one, but it's case insensitive. You don't have to have a lower I, as long as the, the whole word is the same as this one, then it's fine, right? So we are not returning that, we're returning ticket, ticket ID. Uh, we're gonna put an ID here, and then we put a dollar sign there as string interpolation, interpolation. So I'm gonna have this here, right? It's very similar to the express version. And then we are going to do the HTTP post, which is for the create uh, operation. And again, we're gonna have API slash tickets, uh, and that's it. And I'm gonna copy this paste over here. And this one, I'm gonna call it the post. Um, this one, in order to make it different, so I'm just say get by ID, and this one is post, which is create. You can call it create if you want. And then this one is going to be update, which is put. Uh, and let me change the message here. Let's say creating a ticket, and this is HTTP put, right? And then this one is going to say updating. Uh, updating a ticket, 
right? Usually you would have uh, some objects pass in, but because that's going to be covered by model binding, so we're not going to cover that in this uh, video. So we have that, and then we're going to have the delete one. And this one, we're going to say delete, and we are deleting ticket number. And this one, the HTTP verb is going to be HTTP delete. So uh, this is it. And uh, remember, we have just these two as a combination. Can find the function that you want to hit, right? And by the way, in controller, a VC controller, this method is called action method. All right, let, let's give it a test. All right, let's do control F5. Okay, and this, reading all the tickets, right? And if we are reading a particular one, we can just say, right? So we can say, we can see that we're reading ticket 1122. If I add three at the back, it has that, right? What if I say P, uh oh, problems happen when or more validation errors occurred, right? So this is a by default, there is a model validation there. Uh, and we will need to use the PowerShell. So let me bring up the PowerShell. PowerShell and test web API. And what is the URL? The port number is 44314. 44314, right? So let's replace, let's replace 3000 with, actually let's replace 3000 tickets with 44314 slash API slash tickets. And by the way, this 44314, it comes from under properties, go to the launch settings, and you can see that it's right here. So the SS port, SSL port is 44314. And that's because we're using IIS, uh, IX Express. And uh, if we were to use this, then it will go with this setting here. All right, so let's give that a test with the PowerShell and we let's test this one, see if that works or not. Select it and click on this run selection. And then we're gonna highlight this again. And oh, this is wrong. Uh, Cause the, we're using HTTPS and we're gonna run the selection. All right, so that return, and then we highlight this, run this again, we can see that reading tickets, one, two, three, four, five, right? And that's fine. And then this one, uh, this one, we're gonna highlight it again, and then run this. Actually, that's a waste a lot of time. Just have this. And then I just highlight this and select this. It returns creating a ticket, right? So basically it runs and then uh, it runs the two lines. So when it runs this line, it's gonna spit out what's in this variable, response variable, right? And let's test the put, updating a ticket, and let's test this. It's deleting ticket one, two, three, four, five. And if I were to add number nine, for example, and highlight this, and you have one, two, three, four, five, nine, right? And what if I put, uh, P, for example, and then we'll see what the error is. Now we see the error, the remote server returned an error, 400 bad request. Okay, so it has the default model validation. All right, so that's the first way to do routing, which is attribute routing. And uh, you can see that there is a problem because for each method, you have to do specifically specify the routing, which is convenient in a sense. Um, but if you want to make it mo even more convenient, right? Because we are using a very uniform uh, interface. So th there's a pattern there, right? So um, so actually, this is actually supposed to be tickets. Tickets. I got it around there. So there's a pattern there. So what is the pattern then? We can use... Um, we can, we can use attribute routing on the controller, right? And then we can just say that uh, the controller name, this is a routing template again, right? So we have this controller name here, 
right? And this controller name corresponds to the word that is in front of this controller word, right? So that's what's happening here in the startup class where you have this map controllers. And what did this do when it runs this uh, middleware? What it does is that it's going to go into the assembly, right? This class library, well, it's not class library. And this assembly is going to look for the whether there is a class or classes that ends with the controller word. And if there is, then it's going to look into the HTTP request. And then according to the URI and the verb, it's going to map to the, uh, going to find the action method, right? So in here, we're just saying that uh, if the URL in the HTTP request contains API and also contains tickets, then we are going to look for an action method. And because uh, everything can, and then we can remove the ROS here, right? But this one, this particular one has a, a addition, which is the uh, ID. But what can we, we can do here is we can add that over here and then I will work too. So then if that works, then we don't need all of this, this uh, duplicate ROS. Again, here, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to add the rod, rod template here, and then that will work as well. So let's build this, and then let's run the test again, right? So highlight this, run it. See, it says reading all tickets, right? Well, let's highlight everything and just run everything. Oh, the last one has an error. And let's remove this. And then I go here, I'm going to clear this, and then I'm just doing this. So, oh, okay, okay. So I changed the, the rods. I fixed the rods now. And then again, we're going to clear and come back and run it. Now we see reading all the tickets, reading tickets one, two, three, four, five, creating a ticket, updating ticket. Everything looks correct here, right? Everything looks correct. So this is kind of like a convention based rotting uh, where you have this rot attribute set for the controller. And then it's going to look for the word in front of the controller to map to this particular controller, right? And if you have a project's controller, for example, you have one ticket belongs to, sorry, you have many tickets belongs to one project, then you have con project's controller, then you can say, uh, you can set up a rot here, rot attribute and says API slash controller, Right? but then it's going to map to the project word. Right? That's it for this video. We covered two types of routing, attribute routing on the action method and attribute routing on the controller. Now that we created a controller that contains a group of rods or endpoints that corresponds to the tickets, now I would like you to work on creating another controller for the project, right? So you create a projects controller that contains all of the CRUD operations for projects. And I want to clarify that you focus on the routing because we just learned routing. You don't need to create the model classes for the project. And you certainly don't need to come back and create the uh, class for the tickets, right? Just focus on the routing, make it very similar to this. And please work on that and then after you finish and take a look at the next video in this video I'm gonna give the suggested answer for the projects controller so I'm going to create a new class and I'm gonna call it projects controller and you have to be very careful that this controller has to be the controller word and then this one I like to use plural because that kind of corresponds to that rots, right? You always have plural as the rots. Last time I made a mistake, I used ticket instead of tickets. So, but, but, it's, but it's wrong. And uh, what I can do, I guess, I just simply copy this whole thing. And I am going to come over here and replace with it. And of course, I need to change this to two projects and 
So I'm gonna also replace ticket with this project and I'm gonna remove this, right? So then now everything should be good. All right, so let me give it a test. I did control, did I do control F5? I gotta do control F5 and bring up this. Well, it's building, I'm gonna duplicate this uh, and then I'm gonna add some comments here. Well, so in PowerShell, you use uh, the pound sign or the number sign as comment. And then I'm gonna highlight this and I'm gonna replace all of the ticket tickets with uh, projects. And well, I would imagine it's already done. So I, I'm going to highlight this and I'm gonna just run like that. Now it says reading all the projects, reading projects, creating, updating, this is all about projects. And what if I just uh, clear the screen and then I'm just going to run the whole thing. So <clears throat> now I see the first set, right? This first set uh, deal with the tickets and the second set deal with the projects. So that's my suggested answer. In this video, let's talk about model binding. As I mentioned before, model binding is the process of binding the information from HTTP request to the parameters of your particular action method, right? It can be a primitive type like this, or it can be a complex type like an object. We'll deal with that a little bit later. But how does that work? We have seen this example when we deal with the get or the delete, the ID comes from the rod directly fed to the parameter. How does that work? I wanna cover that a little bit first. So let's look at this, um, this chart. We have this pipeline that HTTP message uh, request goes in. And imagine this is the middleware the the controller middleware the map controller middleware and how does how this works is that the map controller middleware itself actually has another pipeline in it and it makes sense because we're always dealing with this request right and when that happens uh let's draw another one another pipeline here okay uh, actually let's make it a pipeline uh a separate pipeline like this okay and then a smaller pipeline that specifically deal with this is MVC. This is called the MVC invocation pipe pipeline, right? So this, let me send this back, all right? And then I'll and then I'll duplicate this guy. Probably need to send this back again. All right, duplicate this guy. So you see, we can have multiple of this another pipeline, right? And this, these went with this. We don't call it middleware. We call it filter. So the message, the HTTP request message, will actually go through these filters. And eventually, it will hit our function. Let's imagine, oops, so let's, let's imagine this is the, the function, right? The tricky part about this is doesn't always, like it doesn't return when it returns, it doesn't return to uh, through all of these, right? It's not like, uh, the middleware pipeline will always return. It will actually, uh, I'll show you another picture later, but for now, I'm not gonna draw this cause it's kind of complicated to draw. Uh, it's gonna go and some of them, for some of the filters, it will, will, will go go through the filter. And then it will, when it go back, it goes through that filter as well, right? And it may get around some of these filters when it returns, but that's, uh, that's that's not, um, that doesn't matter. We're talking about another pipeline. This is what I wanted to talk about, right? So like, imagine this, this is actually the, your action method, you know? This is the remote function that you, you're trying to host remotely, right? Uh, you would have a model binding filter and then a model validation filter, for example. And then you may have, uh, uh, your action filter, and then you have your own function. Well, let's use this as the example of the function, right? 
And actually, after that, there's another one. It's called result filter. The purpose of this is just showing you how the model binding works, right? The model binding is just one of this filter, and each filter is, again, a function. And that also, this can be configured in the startup.cs class, right? Uh, so with this function here, it will take the HTTP context, right? And then it will we'll go into it, and then it will look for information from, so if you look at this, uh, this page from Microsoft, you can see that the information comes from either form fields or request body or raw data or query stream, right? Or uploaded files. Uh, so by default, it will look for, see, by default, it will get data uh, from the following five different places. Right. If you can't find it, then if you don't want to use default, right, you can actually specify by using these uh, attributes. Let's do some demo. I have already done this. This is raw data, right? This comes from the raw. This ID comes from the raw, right? So, and then let's do another one that is from the query. So what does it mean from the query? That means from query string. So the question mark, the information of the question mark in the, in the, in the URL. So, so this is project. Let's say we want another endpoint here that gets a particular pro, a particular ticket under a particular project, right? So I want the endpoint to be like like APIs projects, right? And then I want it to be a particular project, and then right. So this is gonna be project ID, and then I want this one to be uh tickets and here i wanted to provide uh the ticket id like this right so how do i do that of course i'm going to create the action method and always return the action result and then i'm going to say get uh get project ticket well it's probably a bad name but but it doesn't matter it serves the purpose so I want my first PID, project ID, come from the rot. Actually, uh, let's demonstrate. So this is, these two both come from the rots, right? I don't want it to, to, to do this because I want to demonstrate one rot and one query string, right? So this is going to be TID equals one, two, three, for example, right? TID. And I'm going to have, this is going to be HTTP get. I'm going to have a PID here, right? And this, we can't use, uh, can we still use this routing template, right? If we look at this, we have API projects. Yes, it corresponds to this. And then it has this, and then it has tickets. So this, we can't use um, the default one anymore. So we have to override it. So, so the, in that case, we don't need this ID to be here. We can use a uh, rot directly, right? We can use this rot to override that default one in, in here, right? So override this one. So how do we do that? We have to, there's something we need to pay attention. We need to use the slash to indicate that this rot is going to be based on the, the root, right? If we don't use the slash, it's going to be based on this. So I, in order to override that one on the controller class, I have to use slash API slash, and then uh, you know the project, and then we say you know, PID, right? So I'm going to use this and this to demonstrate that it's not case sensitive, right? And and then I'm gonna say tickets, right? So if you want to use the rot template to do the data binding, then you can just put the TID, TID here, right? But uh, I'm trying to use a query string data binding. So I'm going to just return a string in a HTTP 200. Uh, with HTTP 200 status code, uh, I'm just saying uh, rating 
project number PID and ticket number TID. Because we didn't specify which raw, like which uh, sources comes from. It can come from all the different five different sources, right? It, come from, it can come from query string, it can come from uh, header, it can come from body, it can come from the raw template. Uh, it can come from all those five different places. What it's going to do is it's going to um, look for those one by one. And as soon as it finds one, then it will bind it to the parameter. Okay, so let's give it a try. I am going to run control F5. And it shows up on my the other screen. So I'm going to do API slash uh, projects. And I'm going to do, let's say, 56. Right, and then we're going to do tickets. And um, I am going to, if I do this, watch what happens. It will say this cannot be found, right? Because we didn't specify it. But what if I provide you know, something like that? Oh no, I have to specify the query string name. So TID, right? So then it will go into the platform, it's going to go into the TID, go into the query string and look for the one that, that is called TID. And then it will find it. And what if I don't provide a query string? Watch what happens. It provides a default value. For an integer, the default value is zero, right? Then what we can do is we can use some uh, if statement and saying if the TID is zero, then we can use this to return. We can use this to return reading all the belong to project PID. Right. Let me use string interpolation here. Right. So if that's the case, then we do that. Otherwise, it's just going to uh, regularly, you know, return return this. So we don't need the curly braces here, right? So we can do that, something like that. So we're taking advantage of that. So this is going to show us all of the tickets that belongs to project 56, right? So reading all the tickets belong to project 56. And if we do have a TID query string, it's reading project 56 ticket number one, right? So, and, and we know that ticket number one belong to project 56. And another thing I want to demonstrate is you can specify where this come from. Right? You can say from query, right? So this you're specifically telling it this parameter will come from query. Otherwise, if you have the TID in the header, it's going to uh, bind to this parameter. But if you specify this has to come from query, then it will not read from any other places. Okay, so let's give that a try. I'm going to build this again. I'm going to go in here. And this should still work. Okay, so this is still working. Number 12. And if I don't provide it, it says reading all the tickets. In the previous video, we have talked about model binding to primitive data type from rot uh, as well as from query. Right? In this video, uh, we're going to talk about model binding from rot as well as from query to a complex data type. Same here, we're going to use the same method here. So we are, sorry, we are going to uh, do the same thing, but with a complex data type. Right? Usually we don't do it this way. I just want to show you there is this possibility to do it this way. So if um, I'm having this PID and TID, right? But we can actually map it to a ticket object, right? I don't have a ticket object, but that's that's fine. Uh, I'm gonna go over here, and I'm going to first of all create a, a folder, and I'm gonna call it models, and I'm gonna create a model class, and I'm gonna call it ticket, right? And a ticket, <clears throat> let's give it some simple field to to start with. So of course it's gonna have a, a ticket ID, right? And 
a ticket would belong to a project. So I'm going to give it a project ID. And the ticket may have uh, a title. We'll have to have a title. And it will have to have some description, right? So let's use these simple fields for demonstration purpose, right? Going over here, I'm going to do control dot to import the namespace. And what's going to happen now is, so I'm going to use PID, right? To map to project ID and TID to map to ticket ID. So in that case, I have to go into my ticket class. And then what I need to do is I need to say from query, right? And import a namespace. And then here I'll have to say name equals uh, TID, right? And then from here, I'm going to copy it. Uh, but this one is going to be from the rot, right? And the name equals PID. So this way I'm mapping Sorry, I'm mapping this PID to project ID and then the query string TID to the ticket ID, right? So then I need to change this to uh, ticket ID, uh, ticket ID, right? And this is going to be project ID and this is ticket ID and this is project ID, right? So we can add more testing here to see whether the ticket is well, let's make it equal. So if it's now, then we're going to return you no know, bad request, right? And then we're going to return some message for saying um, ticket is not provided. Well, probably you can say parame parameters are not provided properly. Okay. And another thing we need to do is we need to here and just specify this uh, comes from Let's say it comes from query, but because inside the class, we said this comes from the rot. So this inside one will override uh, this one, but we will have to say it here. Otherwise, uh, by default, a complex type will look for values from the body. So that will not work. Right? So let's do control F5 and let's see whether it works or not. All right. So we have it over here and then I'm going to slash uh, API slash projects. And uh, let's just use uh, the previous one, 56 and TID is one. And let's see whether it works. Okay. So it's working, right? And we need to provide the uh, title and let's say title is uh, ABC and description is DF. And of course, it's not going to work because um, we are not actually spelling it out here. So we are going to say a uh, title is ticket.title, right? And description is ticket.description. And let's see whether that works or not. Save it, build it, and then let's go over here and refresh. All right, so I have this title ABC description DEIF, right? Because I've already specified at the parameter here, I said it's from query. So by, def by default, everything comes from query. And if I want one of them to come from the rod, then I specify, you know, it comes from the rod, right? So there you go. Uh, this demonstration is showing you that we can actually bind data uh, from rot or from query string to complex data types. I just want to mention that although we are using uh, binding from both rot and query into complex data type, or in the previous video, mapping that, binding that to primitive data type variables as parameters, that's not, it doesn't have to be that way. You can use just the query or just the rod. You don't have to mix them together. I yeah, just want to make that clear. In this video, we're going to cover model binding from body. And model binding from body, usually uh, we use body to provide data to the post method 
or the put or the patch method, right? For create or for update. And let's take the post, for example, and we're dealing with ticket, right? So we can just say the ticket, uh, I'm going to do control dot and import a namespace, then the parameter is ticket. And we want it to come from the, the body. Okay. We want this to come from the body. Uh, what we will try, what we're going to do here is we're going to remove this because this is not really the one that I showed you in the previous video. This is not really common. We don't usually uh, use an object to receive uh, primitive time parameters, right? Because we're the we're only receiving uh, basically we're receiving the ID here, two IDs here. So let's delete this, and then I'm gonna uncomment out this, uncomment this, and I'm gonna use the the original one, right? So that we can go to our ticket object, and we're gonna delete this. We know everything will come from the body and going back to the ticket controller and we use this attribute to decorate this parameter or saying that this parameter come from the body right and then we're directly just displaying this ticket so when we use okay with the object okay, it's going to automatically serialize the object into json so you're going to see uh, how it works and so i have this running on uh, you know the other window but because we are trying to do post and i'm going to use the powershell script so the content type here has to be uh, json to post the ticket we need to create the json so first we can declare a body object and then we use a uh, PowerShell script to create a PowerShell uh, body, right? And we can just say, because we have uh, we have that already in there, we can say this is the uh, the, the ticket ID, right? Uh, well, we don't have a ticket ID, right? Because we're creating a ticket. So we don't have a ticket ID, but we know the this ticket belongs to, uh, let's say, project one, right? And then, uh, there's no comma. This is PowerShell object. So, and then we have title. Uh, we'll say oh, this is my first bug. And then we'll have description. And uh, we'll say this is very strange. Okay, so we have this body. And this is not a JSON. This is a PowerShell, uh, PowerShell object. Right. So I'm going to have another uh, JSON body variable here and then I'm going to say convert to uh, JSON right so this is a method and then the input object is the the body body object so this will be the JSON uh, object sorry this is yeah this is going to be the JSON body and then here we're going to say uh, body uh, equals sorry body and then we provide the JSON body here, right? We highlight all of this, right? And then we run F8, right? So what we got is we got a ticket ticket ID is zero, project ID is one, title, this is my first bug, description, this is very strange, right? And if you, it's still stored in the memory. So we highlight response and do this, it's gonna give us this back again. Right, so that means it's triggering our uh, post method. Right, same thing can be applied to the post put method. Right, uh, this is from body, and then we're going to simply just output the same thing goes in, the same thing goes out. It doesn't do anything, um, but this is just to verify that our method works. So I'm just going to build a solution, and then I'm going to go to PowerShell. And I'm going to clear this and go over here. And I am going to just say, uh, I'm going to copy this and put it under uh, just above here. And I'm going to say body put. And this is body put. And this is JSON body put. 
and I'm going to copy this variable and I am going to give it to this body of this put method, right? And this is incorrect because the uh, the body that you're trying to update, I mean, the ticket that you're trying to update has to have a ticket ID, right? There's no validation right now, but uh, but still, we need to make it work this way, right? So we are going to um, body put, JSON body put. All right, so let's highlight this. And then we're going to run this. And it gives us the, so the remote server return unsupported media type. Oh, I forgot to uh, provide the media type, right? So I'm going to paste it over here. And since we already have a JSON put, right? We can, we can verify, yeah, the JSON put is right here, right? So we don't, hide, we don't have to select all of them. We can just do this. And then F8, right now I have uh, everything. I have the ticket ID 100, right? This one does have the ticket ID and everything is, is there. This is it. We can see that the model binding filter the built-in model binding filter is doing its work. It binds information from the HTTP request body to our uh, input parameter, right? This is what I was saying that uh, the way that we were doing from uh, Node.js Express is very simple and straightforward. Whereas here you do have, you do a little bit of extra work, but you know you have everything cleaner. You don't have to do a lot of work inside the function. Although I have to say uh, I was just using Express for demonstration purpose, so uh, I'm not too sure whether Express has uh, their own way, its own way to do things in a simple way. Uh, I was just saying that if we just created the framework just like the what I demonstrated, then you know it's missing something like you know model binding. And later we'll see model validation and stuff. In this whole section, we're going to talk about model validation. Model validation is the process of validating user input for each endpoint. Without model validation, developers will have to validate the user input inside each endpoint. And for example, when the user is trying to call the post endpoint to create a ticket, the ticket, the information comes from the user input. Any user input, as I mentioned before, cannot be trusted right? because most of the users are using our endpoint for the purpose that the endpoint is the intent to do. But even that, users can make mistakes and sometimes provide some information that is invalid. In other cases, some users are using it for malicious purpose. So we have to validate every single input when necessary, right? However, if we are checking things like, you know, using this kind of method, right? Go into each one of them and deal with each one of the uh, field. Some, some object can have hundreds of field. Then your endpoints will be flooded with all of the validation logic. And we know that in software development, we have a single responsibility principle where we hope that in one place, we try to deal with a single problem, right? Because you see that validation is not the actual purpose of our endpoint. Our endpoint is, in this case, is going to take the ticket and trying to insert the ticket information into the data store and create a new ticket for us, right? And in the uh, case that you use Web API uh, to deal with business logic, then the developer's job in creating this endpoint is to uh, call some other object, objects to deal with business logic, the validation and all other things it's better for them to be handled in other places. So where else can we handle those validations? Well, let's look at this diagrams that we have 
uh, I've seen before. So these are the middlewares as I have shown before. And then this is the MVC invocation pipeline, right? It's also called filter pipeline. And we're going to talk about the, this later. Um, but what I last time I was saying there is a model binding filter. Uh, there is actually a step where we do model validation as well. It's also part of the pipeline. Although if you look at the documentation uh, from Microsoft, you don't see the model validation in the, the filter pipeline, but it is in there, right? Because it's the model validation is executed before the endpoint is invoked. Right. So in this section, we're going to talk about different type of validations for different purposes, but all of them uh, happen within the pipeline before the endpoint is invoked. In this video, we're going to cover uh, model validation with data annotation. So data annotation is uh, a bunch of uh, attributes that you can apply to each one of the field inside your model class. So for example, when you try to create a ticket, you want your project ID to be required, right? You need a project ID, you need a title. Perhaps you don't have to have a description. So in that case, you can say this uh, project ID is required. And if we do control dot to import namespace, you can see that the data annotation namespace comes from system dot model uh, system dot component model dot data annotations so i'm going to hit enter to import the namespace right here so i'm going to apply this required attribute on uh, the title as well so uh, the data annotation namespace comes with uh, many attributes i'm going to demonstrate these two for now so how this works is that those attributes inside the data annotations namespace are independent from MVC. So you can actually trigger the validation of your objects. The, for example, in this case, the ticket objects separately, right? With, with the validator class. So you, you can do your own search, uh, search the validator class, and you can see how to trigger the validation manually. With Web API or MVC, the validation is triggered just before the action method is called, right? So you don't have to trigger it manually, right? So let's, uh, let's give it a try. So let's go over here and you can see that we need a post, right? From the body for creating the ticket. Right. So in this, uh, in this section, I'm going to start use Postman. So I want to help you to understand that we can test with uh, a lot of different tools. So I'm just demonstrating Postman in this section. So, uh, if you haven't installed Postman, you can uh, search and download Postman. It's a free tool you can use. All right. So I'm going to create a new uh, request and, uh, I'm going to call it create ticket and I'm going to create a new collection. I'm going to call it web API course. And then I'm going to click on the save to web API course button. And now I have this create a uh, ticket, which is enter the web API course. We're going to change this to a post, right? And we are going to launch this by pressing control F5. Okay, I can see the URL is this. So I'm going to go to here and then I'm going to do slash API slash tickets. Now I know my body uh, is supposed to be, I'm choosing raw and then I'm choosing the content type to be application JSON, right? And I'm going to provide the JSON information and we have ticket ID, um, project ID, title and description. First, let's uh, not providing the project ID. Let's just provide the title, right? And so I'm going to say this is my second bug, 
and then description description is this bug is obvious so in this case i'm going to click on the set button let's see what happens because i didn't provide the project id i'm going to expect that there's going to be an error oh it did not trigger the validation that's because binding happens first and then validation model validation happens secondly so when binding happens first the default value for integer is zero so then when you uh, use required to validate this it's going to pass the validation because there is already a value so in order to fix this issue we're going to use a nullable integer right so the question mark here says we can assign null so now the default value becomes null and then the validation the required validation attribute will will start work and let's see so i'm going to build this again and then and then i'm going to click on the send button again and as you can see that we have a HTTP 400 which is bad request right? and the error says the project field is having some problems and the error message is project field is required all right let's modify this to create a proper project and what we need is the project id right and let's give any number we want let's say 789 there's a comma and if i click on send button it's going to return the project back back to me in json then notice that it changed the lowercase change the first letter to lowercase and that's the default format of json and since we didn't provide didn't say that description is required so we can test this test case right click on send then it still works right and if i don't provide title so this is another test case don't provide title it's going to tell me that the title field is required with data annotations the uh, each attribute represents certain validations and in inside the invocation pipeline after the model binding the each attribute will be used to validate each one of the field so let's take a look at what kind of validation attribute do we have okay so this is a complete list and we have things like compare attribute which you can use to um, for example make sure two passwords match right and uh, you can have credit card attribute which is to validate credit card number uh, you can have uh, things like email address make sure a the user provided a valid email address right this is a format validation and you have max lens right to and minimum lens to um to limit the the length of a array or a string and you have a phone number attribute you know you're trying to make sure it's a valid phone uh, phone number and uh, a range attribute which uh, you can use to uh, to validate a number range right and then you have a regular expression of course you can use a regular expression to to validate your field and uh, you have string lens you know you, you're trying to control your length of the string uh, there's minimum and maximum uh, attribute that you can use and uh, and url for example and all the other stuff right so you can apply all these different uh, data annotations to each one of the field data annotation works really well when trying to validate a single field inside model class this attribute validates this property this attribute validate this property but once you start working on real world projects very often there are situations where you have to validate model class object as a whole right so let me give you an example uh, let me extend this class a little bit so let's say we have a owner property right so when you assign a ticket to someone that person becomes the owner of the ticket right and then you have daytime uh, again it's nullable daytime and uh, this is going to be let's say a due date right so the custom logic is that when there is an owner so this owner is not a required field 
right? Because when you first create a ticket, there's no owner. And when someone assigned this ticket to someone else or assigned the ticket to himself or herself, then the owner will have a value. So the custom logic is that when the owner has a value, then there has to be a due date, right? And if there's no owner, if this is empty or null, this owner is empty or null, then the due date can be null as well. So we can't use the built-in data annotations. This is a custom uh, validation logic. We have to use something else. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about something that is called validation attribute, right? So let me create a folder and we are going to call it model validations. And I'm gonna add a new class in it. And I'm going to call this class ensure due date for ticket owner. So I'm gonna start this with ticket. So I know that this validation class is for the ticket model, right? So ticket and a score ensure due date for ticket owner, right? And and here's here's the thing, right? There is a uh, class that is called validation, sorry, validation attribute, and I'm gonna do control dot, and we see that we can um, import that still from the same data annotation a namespace, which means this is a still data annotation, but it's a custom data annotation. And inside here, we can override is valid with the validation context, right? with the validation context pro, uh, parameter. And inside here, what we can do is we can get the model object from the validation context, right? So if we do this, you can see that there is a object instance, right? So this object instance is referring to the object where this attribute is used upon. Right. I'm going to show you that uh, very soon. But with this object in, uh, instance, what we can do is we know that we're going to use this on the ticket. So we're going to say uh, ticket, right? And then I'm going to do control dot and import the model class namespace, right? And then I'm going to call it ticket, right? And uh, here, when I have the ticket, then I can use that to see now, if ticket is not now, and if actually to be safer, let's use this way of conversion, right? If it's not now, and if ticket dot owner is not now or white space, or is is not now or white space, I'm gonna use a explanation mark here, right? So in this case, I need to make sure that the due date is is there and i'm going to say if uh, ticket dot due date has value right because this is a nullable date so the nullable any nullable uh, object has um, has this has value right so if it doesn't has value it means it's null right so if it is uh if it doesn't have value then we know there's something wrong because if you have an owner, right? So this line says the ticket has an owner, but this line says the ticket doesn't have a due date. Then uh, what we need to do is we need to return, right? So let's, this is just one line of code. So I'm gonna put it uh, down here. I'm gonna say return new validation result, right? And uh, uh, we are going to hard code a, uh, error message i'm gonna say um due date is required when assigning let's say when when the ticket has an owner right and if otherwise then what we're just gonna say validation context dot success we're returning sorry validation result validation result dot success so when the owner is there, but there's no due date, we're gonna return a error message, right? Otherwise it's a success. So with this, 
what we can do is we can copy this uh, class name and then we can go into the ticket and we can use that to decorate the due date right and can decorate the due date and of course we need to control dot import the namespace then that's decorated right and and let's check the controller right so the ticket comes in from the body which is correct and uh and yeah so we can do it we can do a test right now i'm gonna do control f5 i know it's running on the other window so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna come over here i'm gonna do the post right so right now it's supposed to be good well no that's not good we gotta have the project id okay so the project id is 100 comma and then if i click on this just to test yeah so our service is running uh, the due date is on. Uh, the owner is now, and due date is now. Right now, if I give it a owner and say owner is myself, now what well, I'm expecting to see an error. Right, good. So we have this due date. Due date is required when the ticket has an owner. Right. This is exactly what we did. This is the custom error message we hard coded, and it comes in from. Um, this nice error message inside this. Right? It's consistent with all the other data annotation errors. Right? You want the error to be uh, returned in a consistent format. Right? right? You can't return one error in one format and then return a different type of error in a different format. Then your client will be confused how to handle these error messages. Right? And let's fix this error. Uh, by providing the due date since we have an owner then let's use a due date that is in the future let's say uh, it's going to be January 1st today is December I think 19th or something so uh, yeah I think that should be good and now we have a due date we have an owner and everything looks good so this is the validation attribute that we can use to enforce some custom validation. Right? So just to recap what we need to do, right? we need to go to, we need to create a class and derive that class from the validation attribute class. And then we need to override the is valid method, right? And we need to provide the validation. And if it's if there's anything wrong, we return a new validation result, providing the error message. And if everything is correct, then we just simply return validation result as success. Then after we implement this custom validation class, we can use because this derives from the attribute, right? So this is actually an attribute. You can put attribute at the end if you want. Uh, and then you use that attribute on the uh, property that you that makes most sense, right? Uh, keep, in keep in mind that you have access from the validation context, you have access to the whole ticket object, right? You can inspect every single uh, field inside here, right? But for this particular one, this is most related to due date. So it's best to uh, put it, to decorate the due date with this attribute. But it doesn't mean that it can only inspect one field. It can inspect all the other fields inside the ticket because it simply has access to the whole ticket uh, object through the object instance property. Here is an assignment for you to practice this creating a custom model validation by using the validation attribute. So the requirement is this, that you have this ticket, you have this ticket model class. When you are creating a ticket and when there is a owner, then your due date has to be there, which is already ensured by using this attribute. But, but I'm giving you an additional validation that you have to do it yourself which is that due date has to be in the future. 
Again, this is creating ticket. And your due date has to be in the future when there is a owner, right? I want to uh, make sure that you create a separate class because here, this class is to ensure due date for ticket owner, which means ensure, ensure the presence of the due date when there is an owner, right? So now the additional logic is that the, the, we are trying to ensure the due date is in the future, right? Don't use this. I know you can use everything. You can literally validate every single field inside the same attribute, but I don't want to do that. I would like you to create a separate class for this purpose. And you can call it ticket and a score, ensure due date in the future or something like that. All right, let's go ahead and create that validation attribute. So I'm gonna create a new class and I'm gonna call it ticket and a score, ensure due date in future. And again, this is going to derive from validation attribute. Control dot to import the namespace and override is valid with the second signature. Minimize the solution explorer, delete this line. And what is tricky about this assignment is that you have to know that this is this logic is only applied when you are creating a ticket right so when you're updating a ticket a ticket is a valid ticket if the due date is in the past right because there are situations where you know when you work on a ticket and it's it's still and you're still working on it so the due date is in the past but you want to add some comments to the to the ticket which is allowed right so you can't apply this logic uh, this validation when you're updating the ticket you, you should only apply this when you are creating the ticket. But how do you know? Remember, this is this um, validation attribute comes from the data annotation uh, uh, namespace, and this has nothing to do the with MVC or Web API. This is you can literally use this type of validation even in a console application, right? So how do you know you're creating a ticket? we can use the ticket ID because when you are creating a ticket, the ticket ID will be null. The ticket ID is a nullable integer, right? So you can use that to tell. So what we can do is we can get the ticket from the validation context and object insurance as ticket, right? Import namespace. So now we have the ticket and uh, we have to make sure what we are checking is you know, ticket is not now. And at the same time, the ticket ID is now. So this makes sure that when we are creating ticket, right? So when creating ticket, ticket due date has to be in the future, right? So this is what we are trying to do. And this if condition makes sure that the ticket is, uh, is being created. Okay, so when we are creating the ticket, we need to check that um, if ticket dot due date has value and ticket due ticket dot due date value is in the past, which means daytime now, right? So if this is in the past, then this is wrong. So what we need to do is we need to return a new validation result and by providing the error message we're going to say that um due date has to be in the future due date has to be in the future right and if it's not the case then this is a success so we're going to return validation result dot success that's it that's it right and we're going to test this I'm going to copy this and use it to decorate this after the ensure the due date is there. We're ensuring the due date is in the future, All right? So let's give it a try. I'm going to do, I'm going to rebuild this. I know the service is running, right? And we're going to go over here 
and we are going to uh of course this is going to work because this we are posting right and we are this is going to work because this due date is in the future oh obviously it's not running so i'm going to do control f5 all right so we created a ticket right well it's, it's not <laughs> we haven't actually implemented anything we were just uh we're just testing so this 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 message returns this json object returns meaning we actually uh pass the validations right so let's uh, try to see if we provide something like this is going to be um you know early this year right january 1st this year 2020 this is in the past so i'm going to expect i have this error message which i'm seeing this message saying due date has to be in the future what if we're testing the put? Because we are doing the put, so we have to provide the ticket ID, right? So let's say the ticket ID is one, and then I'm going to do the send, right? Now, even though the due date is in the past, we're still okay, right? Because we are updating the ticket and we already have a ticket ID. So this is, this is the logic. And let me know when you have any questions in the QA area, uh, I'm always, happy to answer your questions in this video we're going to talk about what is filter pipeline and why we need filter pipeline i know i have talked about this before when we talk about model binding and model validation but in this section we're going to talk about the filter pipeline in depth so let's think about when the http request comes in what exactly we need to do with the request, right? What are the steps we need to do with request? We need authentication and authorization. We need some generic validation that is unrelated to data. You probably don't know what a generic validation is if it's unrelated to data, but I'm gonna show you later, right? Just hang on. And we need to, um, we need to retrieve the input data, right? And we need to um, validate. Well, we should call it data validation, right? And we need to finally do our application logic, right? And this is the core. This is this is what we want to do: application logic or or, or data, or or sharing and manipulating data, right? And um, we need to format format the output data in specific formats that we want right and then last but not least we need to handle exceptions so exception handling so if you look at the list of this whole thing certainly like i said before you can do every single thing here in this action method and Unfortunately, if you choose to do it this way, you do it here and you have to do it here, you have to do it here, you have to do all of that inside each one of them. And the worst part is that this is the only thing that the developer, you, want to focus on. Why do you have to do all of that in the same place, which is a mess, right? And that's why we needed the filter pipeline. And let's take a look at the Microsoft documentation regarding the filter pipeline for SPDNI Core 5.0, right? Uh, and this is how the filters work. See, these are the middleware, right? So this is middleware, this is a middleware. The rotting middleware is the one that is used to select an action method to execute. Right, so that's why the next step is action selection. So once the action selection is done, then the HTTP request, right? Uh, so here, this this line uh, represents the HTTP request, right? The HTTP request comes from the the top and traveling through each one of the middleware. And once the action selection is done, it goes into the MVC action invocation pi pipeline, which is also called filter pipeline so in this course i'm gonna now refer starting from now referring to it as a filter pipeline right it goes through the pipeline the filter pipeline and then it will go out and then finally right go out through all of these middleware and then finally goes 
uh, completely outside, right? So let's dive a little bit deeper and look at this picture. So this is the, the filter pipeline, right? This is the gray box or the black box here. This is the filter pipeline. And if we look at it, you can see that this is the authorization filter and this is the resource filter. And then if there's model binding filter here, right here, right? It's not a filter, but it's a one step, right? So basically uh, the, the HTTP request has to travel through the model binding, right? And then it didn't mention model validation, but I'm pretty sure model validation also happens uh, like somewhere after the model binding, right? And, and then it goes through the action filter, which is before the action is executed. And then the result goes back into the action filter and then goes through the exception filter, result filter, right? And goes through the result filter again, and it goes around several of these filters and go back to resource filter and go out. So these are these, this picture, each one of these filters corresponds to what I've uh, demonstrated here, right? What I wrote there. So if I do it this way, and then I put this one here, you can see that the authentication and authorization corresponds to the authorization filter. The generic validation corresponds to the resource filter. The model binding, right? the retrieve and input data corresponds to model binding and data validation. Data validation corresponds to the model validation, uh, which is not showing in the picture, um, but it corresponds to that. And you can also use action filters. Actually, the main purpose of having action filter is to do data validation as well, right? But if we can use the validation attribute, which I presented in the previous section, if we can use that, then we don't have to use the action filter. And then as a developer, you are mainly responsible for to, to, to implement the application logic or uh, uh, sharing or manipulating data, right? And afterwards, this format output data corresponds to the result filter, right? Exception handling corresponds to exception filters. So, so this is the purpose of having the, the filters, right? Having these filters are mainly for uh, separation of concerns so that you as a developer can focus on what you need to do. And therefore we can have a better cohesion of code and satisfies the principle of single responsibility. Another question is why do we need these filters when we can do the same thing with middleware, right? Because it looks like these Filters are just extension of those, uh, the pipeline, right? They are the same thing as the middleware. Well, they are, they look the same. Uh, they are all little units in the pipeline, right? And the filter pipeline looks just the extension of the middleware pipeline. Well, the difference is that the filter pipeline is within the MVC middleware, right? You see that map controllers, that's part of MVC. The filters in the filter pipeline is able to access the MVC data construct. So in MVC, you would have uh, things like model state, right? You would have uh, the concept of results. You would have uh, authorizations to particular endpoint, right? Particular action methods. So all those things are not available to middleware because middleware is all generic. And another thing is that when you apply the filters, you can choose to apply the filter on a particular action method. You can choose to apply the filter on the whole controller, or you can apply a filter globally to all of the action methods within all of the controllers. Okay, so you have the flexibility, whereas the middleware is only global. You cannot apply a middleware to a particular action method. So that is the reason why you need filter pipeline in addition to the middleware. Pipeline. All right. In this video, 
I'm going to use the action filter to do a validation. So there's situations where you do need to use action filter to validate. Right? You can't use the data annotations anymore. You can't use the validation attributes anymore. So in some cases, you do need to use action filter. I'm going to demonstrate that to you in this video. So the requirement is this. Imagine that we have created our web API, right? And the ticket that we're working with is having these uh, fills. But then after uh, this goes live, more requirements come. And we not only need due date, but our client says we need to have the enter date to specify when the ticket was entered into the ticketing system, into the bug tracker. And additional business logic that is associated with this enter date is that when the owner is assigned to the ticket, we not only need the due date to be there, we also need enter date to be there. Two different dates has to be present. The problem is that, first of all, we already have people using, a lot of people, a lot of clients using this web API, right? Maybe different companies, different corporations already started using our web API. So how can we just change that and all of a sudden everybody's applications start working right that's uh that is a versioning i'm gonna touch on versioning just a little bit in this uh and i'm gonna just hard code the versioning so how do we do the versioning there are different ways to do the versioning uh i'm gonna just like i said touch on that and i'm gonna change the method to version one i right? post version one and uh what else i need to change i need to overwrite this um this rotting template right so to override that i'm going to use rot and i'm going to say slash api remember to override it we has we have to use the slash at the beginning and i'm going to say slash um api slash v1 version one and uh slash uh tickets right so this is this corresponds to that and then here, we create another one. I'm going to call it version 2 and post v2. And the version 1 will use the existing data annotations, right? We have two data annotation uh, validations. One is both of them are custom. And for on version 2, that's when we're going to use our action filters to validate our ticket. To make sure that when the owner is there, we have not only the due date present, but also the enter date as well. But why we cannot use data annotation? Why do we have to use action filter to do the uh, model validation? Because if we use the data annotation uh, and we create a custom validation attribute and we use that to decorate the or to annotate the enter date field inside the ticket object right class then the problem is that logic that validation logic it will be applied to version one as well as version two right it's going to be applied to all of the versions we have no control over that because data annotations uh, has nothing to do with mvc and that's why we need to use action filter uh, to validate this specific logic. All right, so let's start with creating another folder and let's call it filters. Okay, and again, because this filter is for uh, validation, so we're going to have the same naming uh, convention. We're going to say, you know, this is for ticket and we're trying to ensure the entered date, right? Ensure the enter date. And that's it. And what we need to do is the action filter is actually a attribute already. Action filter uh, attribute and do a control dot and import the MVC filters namespace. And 
since we derive from there. So the only thing we need to do is to override the on action executed, on action executing. Right. So this. Uh, so let's take a look at the chart. So we have act, we we have this on action executed, and we have this we have this on action executing, and then it has its own uh, asynchronous version as well. For now, let's use the uh, synchronous version. So let's take a look at that picture again. This action method, it goes in, right? So this action filters, the request will travel through the action filter when it goes in and, and uh, it travels through the action filter again when it goes out. So that's why you're seeing that there's on action ex executing. So this is before it goes into the action method and this on action executed is after. But because we're using this for validation, for model validation purpose, so we are going to, um, we're gonna override the on action, action executing method, right? So let me minimize the solution explorer again so that you can see everything. And what we are trying to do here is trying to validate that. Again, we're gonna take the context and then, uh, this time the context has this action arguments and we know that we are going to uh, use this action filter right to this action method apply that to this action method and we know that the argument is the ticket so what we want to do here is we want to uh, so this is action arguments and it's array and uh, we are going to have this uh, this this ticket right this is the ticket. So we use the same name, ticket. And then we convert that to a ticket. Of course, we got to import namespace. And then I'm going to say ticket, right? And again, here we're going to say if the ticket is not now and uh, ticket. So we're ensuring the enter date is there, right? So the enter date, did we even create the enter date? Let's go here and say, Okay, so let's create the enter date because we don't have it yet. Um, so the enter date is also a nullable date. And I'm going to say entered date. Okay, so coming back to the action method, action uh, filter, and then I'm going to say entered date. If it's not now and if it's entered date has value is, uh, is false, then what happens is that we need to short circuit. So short circuiting is a terminology that we use inside the middleware pipeline as well as the action filter pipeline, right? Short circuiting means that before it finishes all of the other filters, we want to short circuit from right here and it goes out like that. So it would skip everything after the action filter. This is called short circuiting, right? Uh, same terminology can be used here. For example, if something wrong happens here, this middleware can short circuit and it will, it will just return directly back. So that's called short circuiting. So going back here and uh, we have our ticket and we have our, uh, so we know that this enter, tick, enter date does not have a value. So this is the condition where that is certified and we need to uh, short circuit. And before we short circuit, we need to uh, add a model error. We need to add an error, right? So the model state is a MVC data construct that we can use. And that's the reason, as mentioned before, that's the reason why we use uh, MVC filters as opposed to middleware, right? Middleware cannot access to the MVC data construct. Uh, in this case, we do need to access the MVC data construct, specifically this model state, right? So the model state, we can call the add model error. And then we just say, uh, what is the key? And what is the error message? The key, in data annotation, we don't have to specify the key. Remember, in the validation attribute, Right? We don't have to specify the key because we are applying that attribute directly on the field. So we know which field is wrong and it will provide the key for you. But here, 
because we're using action filter uh, and action filter can be only applied to uh, to the the actions and we don't actually know which field inside the model class is is wrong so we have to uh, specify it here and what is the what is what is wrong here it's the entered date right so we can say the key is entered date and then we provide an error message and say that um, enter date is required right we don't want to specify like i mentioned we don't want to specify a required uh, annotation here attribute here because that will make our uh, existing clients fail to execute their web api right our web api so that's not what we want but we want to um, any other new clients who uses the v2 version has to satisfy this so then we have our context right and then our result so this is the way we need to uh, uh we can use to short circuit the mvc uh, invocation pipeline which is the filter pipeline and we we can return a bad request bad request object result and import mvc namespace context dot model state we just provide the model state and that's it that's how we short circuit it and and if nothing is wrong see this doesn't have a return value right so if nothing is wrong then, then we do nothing so after this is done and then what we need to do is we're going to take this ticket ensure enter date copy that and go to tickets controller and over here on the, only on the version 2 we're going to apply this attribute right this is a attribute so we can apply it here so this makes sure that version 2 will not have a ticket that doesn't have a enter date when there is owner well well this is our logic is not complete we also have to say that when it doesn't have so before that we're gonna say here because we're gonna apply this attribute on the post method so uh, we don't have to check whether or not the ticket is for creating right we are creating ticket or not but we do need to check that the owner so we have to check the owner is actually there so only when we have a owner and when the enter day is not there then that's that's the condition for us to short circuit it and throw an error throw an error right so then we go back and we apply the ensure uh, enter date and let's give that a test so uh perhaps it's not a good thing to use the version one because uh because we have been testing with without the version one so let's delete that so this uh, this is actually so without the overwriting it so this default rod is the version one all right let's give it a test first we have to do is going to change this to post right and then this endpoint is the version one we know that and because we're posting so we can't posting is creating right so we can't use the ticket id because we don't know what the id is before the record is even created in the data store so i'm going to delete that and this 2020 January 1st is going to cause an error and here is the error right due date has to be in the future so let's change that due date to be in the future and we click on this it's uh it's return the proper json back so this is working right this is working without the enter date and the reason is this is the version one so if we were to change this to version two and uh, if it works properly i would expect that see this if this works properly this corresponds to this endpoint and if it works properly i would expect it throws an error because it requires the enter date to be there so i'm gonna click on send and now i'm seeing the error message entered date is required so that's how we use action method to to do validation right and at this moment we can't use data annotation for this purpose right because data annotation doesn't know about you have two different endpoints one is a version one the other is a version two right data annotations don't have access to the uh, web api data constructs and everything anything else and that's why we're using action filter 
to do the validation. In this video, I want to demonstrate the resource filter. So resource filter is another uh, filter in the filter pipeline. And if you look carefully, the resource filter happens before the model binding, right? which means that uh, by the time that the request hits the resource filter, we don't have access to the data anymore. Right? Model binding is the one that binds the data. So we don't have the uh, access to the data in, in, the, in the model yet. So this is a perfect place to do some generic validations. And in this video, I'm going to show you to use resource filter to retire uh, early versions of our web API. So from the previous video, I have demonstrated using this, uh, creating two versions of the post uh, methods, right? Version one and version two, and this is for creating tickets. Usually we don't do the versioning this way. I'm going to demonstrate proper versioning later, but sometimes we do use this particular way to create a particular version when it's absolutely necessary. Usually we do the versioning for the entire controller, uh, sets of controllers actually. So when we run multiple versions of our endpoints, by the time we don't want to continue to support the older versions, we can inform our users that by uh, a certain day, we're going to retire the, the older versions. So when the time comes, one of the ways to retire the versions is to use resource filters and to, to do a validations and to see whether the user is hitting uh, an endpoint that has the version one in it, in the URL, right? So let's do just that. So in the resource, uh, in the filters folder, I'm right click on it and create a new class and I'm going to call it um, uh, this continue version one. Well, this is probably not a good name. <laughs> it looks like a duplication. So it's version one discontinue. Uh, let's call it discontinue resource filter. Okay. And this one is going to be used as an attribute. So that's why we derive from the attribute class. At the same time, we also implement the resource filter interface. And I'm going to do control dot to import a namespace and control dot again to implement the interface. Right. And I'm going to delete this line. So I don't want to do it after everything is executed. And when it comes back, I want to do it when the request comes in. Right. So that's why I delete this one uh, and I'm going to implement this. So like I said, I want to detect from the URL whether it contains the V1 in it. Right? So I'm going to say, actually, uh, actually in, in our case, we don't have V1 in our version one. So uh, we would have to uh, detect whether we're missing version two. Right, so this is kind of a weird situation. Usually, we would uh, we would create uh, we would cre usually we would create our endpoints with the version one in it. But in the case in this case, uh, following from previous episode, I didn't add the v1 for the v1 endpoints. So we'll have to use uh, a little bit weird validation now. Uh, but I hope you get the point. So context dot, so you see this uh, resource executing context. Uh, so we can take that context and, and then from there we have access to the HTTP context. And then of course, uh, we can access the request object and the pass and then the value, right? And then I'm going to do a two lower and I'm going to check whether it contains uh, V2, right? And if it does not contain V2, that's when we want to retire it, right? And if we do have, if you do have version three, version four, then you have to add more conditions here in the if statement. So if it does not contain V2, in this case, it means uh, this is a V1. So then I have to short circuit it. And as you can see, this is another kind of filter that doesn't return anything. So the, the way to short circuit it 
is to do context dot result. So you basically, if you are returning a result, that means you're short circuiting it. And uh, what kind of result is going to be a bad request object result? All right, similar to the action filter that demonstrated in the previous video. So here um, uh, we are returning the error message, right? And in order to do that, we can create a, sorry, a dynamic object like this. And, uh, and in here we can say, hey, versioning problem, right? And uh, we're gonna provide the, uh, the error message. And, and usually the error messages are in the arrays. And if you look at the um, data annotation uh, error messages, that they're in the arrays. So we're doing this just to be consistent. So I'm gonna say this version of the API has expired. Please use the latest version. All right, so once we have this, then we can apply this filter. Um, the uh, Since we're retiring uh, a version, so it does not make sense to just apply to a particular uh, action method, right? So we can apply this to this controller over here and then uh, we already have the namespace imported so we can build this and let me have the postman over here and let's run this so this is version two and it would still run right because we don't have any due date so when we apply the due date then it's gonna yeah so yeah so this is this is fine right but now if we change this to version one, now I've removed the version two and we're trying to hit the version one endpoint, right? And I'm expecting to see uh, the resource filter to kick in and short circuit the pipeline. So, so now I'm seeing the versioning, right? Error message and it's this version of the API is expired. Please use the latest version, right? This, uh, filter we have applied to the tickets controller, right? What if we have 10 or 20 or 30 controllers in our project? We don't want to apply this filter to all of them, right? So we want to apply this uh, version a discontinuation filter globally. And to do that, it, you, I just want to say one thing before I demonstrate how to do it. So all of these filters, you can configure them in the startup.cs, right? Like almost all of them. So the uh, the way to make them available globally is to go into the configure services and add the add controllers here, we add options to it. So this is arrow functions and um, the way to configure the behavior of those filters or the middlewares can be applied in this way, right? The option using this options uh, configuration. So we can say options dot uh, filters. You, you know, one thing I hope that uh, SPNet core team can do is to provide a user interface. So if we don't know there is this filters, then, you know, it's basically, we don't know. So if they provide a user interface, graphic user interface, then we can see, oh, there are these options we can we can choose and we can make, right? And these built-in middlewares are available. We can choose to uh, to do them instead of to memorize uh, the options that we have, right? Anyways, coming back to this. So we know there's there's this filter and we just add, we're just we trying to add a filter, right? What is the filter we try to add? Uh, we try to add this, um, this filter, which is the version one, right? So I'm gonna copy this filter and then coming back over here and put it over here. And that's it. So once we do this, we're applying that filter globally, right? And as you can see, going back to the tickets controller, I have removed the attribute, right? I have removed that resource filter, but I have added that resource filter globally. So let me build it again, right? And I'm expecting after build, uh, it's gonna continue to work because uh, I have applied it globally. So I'm clicking on the sending button. I can still see the 
the error message. So this is the way how you create a resource filter. Practice time. This time for your practice, I want to add a little bit of logic here. Since in version 2, we introduced the enter date, and we're validating the enter date with the action filter here. Right? And the logic was that when there's an owner, the enter date has to be present. But now that we have the enter date as well as due date, I want to make sure that when you have an enter date as well as a due date, the enter date has to be earlier or the same time uh, as the due date. Right? It makes sense that you enter it early and then you do later. Right? The due date is later than the enter date. So that's the assignment. So because we can capture the validations for different fields uh, within the same action filter by doing this, right? So enter date and we can add a due date. So let's use the action filter, this action filter, to capture uh, those two different validations. So first we need to change the name of the class right? as well as the file name so that it makes more sense. So we really just ensure logic uh, or actually just change it to validate dates and let's add the filter type here and then we are going to go to here and we're going to change the file name as well to to reflect the change and then uh and then we're going to come here and say uh so if the ticket is not now and if there is an owner, uh, and we are going to add two different logic here, right? So we're going to modify this. We're going to say uh, if this is the case and as well as if, right? So if the ticket does not have an enter date, so if there is an owner and there's no enter date, uh, then we are going to uh, short circuit it, right? And and cut this out and we're gonna say uh, and put this logic temporarily here and uh, we're gonna copy this two line and do that validation about the two date so if this is uh, if enter date is there and due date is also there so we have both due date and enter date and here comes the comparison logic right so comparison logic goes the comparison logic goes if uh, entered enter date is greater than due date it's greater than due date then that's wrong right so I have to say that uh, we can add it to due date and say that due date has to be later than the entered date right and then over here Instead of checking the model state is valid, it's better to use a flag here just to make sure that the errors actually truly come from these validations, right? So uh, we can say is valid is true, and then we're gonna assign to make it false in these conditions. All right, and we're gonna use this here. So if is valid is false then we short circuit the filter pipeline by doing it this way all right so let's give that a test you know control f5 and there's error oh yeah because we changed our ticket name sorry changed our filter name so we're gonna go back to the tickets controller and change it and then i'm gonna do control f5 again all right it's so running on the other browser i'm gonna just use uh, this for testing purpose and uh, so we are going to test the case where we have a release we have a enter date and the entered date is later than due date then so we receive the error message due date has to be later than enter date right so so in that case you're gonna make this one later so well, that's due date and enter date is here and now we are good right so we have the correct uh, we created correctly and just to do a regression testing that we didn't break the original validation for the enter date so i'm going to delete the enter date 
and then I'm going to click on send button. Uh, so we get the error message. Enter date is required. We are almost ready. Implement all of these endpoints, right? These action methods. But before doing that, let's take a look at a couple of architectural design problems that we're having. In this video, let's take a look at the first one. You see this model class, right? This models folder supposed to contain a list of model classes that we are concerned about, right? These model classes are within this web API project. And that's a problem. Why is that a problem? You see the model classes represents the data, right? Or we can say it's a message. Whereas the web API is a channel to broadcast the message. And we draw that on a board. So we have a message here, and then our web API is like a channel that is broadcasting the message, right? Our architecture right now is like the message is within the API, right? So you can't broadcast the message in any other way because you see the message can be broadcasted with different channels, right? So we're having a web API channel. What about a WebSocket channel, right? What about the actor directly gaining access to the message? By coupling the message with web API, we are limiting the broadcasting channels, right? So what we need to do is to decouple the message from the channel. So in this architecture design, the message can go through different channels, right? You have the freedom to broadcast the message with any type of channel you want. It can go through Web API, it can go through WebSocket, it can go through any other channels that, that is not on the board. It can even go directly to the actor if that's what you want, right? So that's the first problem that we see. And in the next video, we are going to resolve that problem. In this video, let's decouple the model classes from the Web API project. So let's first create a, a new project. And this is going to be a class library. We're choosing the .NET standard. And later, we will upgrade this to .NET 5. Because at the time of shooting this video, .NET 5 has just been released. I want to show you the upgrade process to mimic the scenarios where you will experience at your workplace. So I'm choosing class library .NET standard and I'm going to call it, uh, instead of call it model classes, I'm going to call it core because later I'm going to put some of the validation logic in it. There could be some architectural design arguments here that regarding whether we should or should not put the validation logic in here, but please stay with this architectural decision and later I'll explain you why I chose to do so. So we are going to create a folder instead of directly putting the classes in there. I'm going to call it models. Okay. And then inside there, we are going to create our uh, project class okay, as well as the ticket class. And our project class is going to be very simple. It's going to contain the project ID. Okay. And then it's going to contain name as well, the name of the project, right? And other than that, a project may have a list of tickets, right? So we are going to uh, have that as well in here. We're going to have a list of ticket. I'm going to call it tickets, right? And we are going to use the add data annotations to uh, do some simple validations on the name property that is, is going to be required. And of course, uh, this is a newly created class library. So it's not there. So we have to actually install the package, the component model dot annotations, right? We can find and install the latest version. All right. And the namespace is automatically imported as well. 
right? So it's complaining about the tickets here. That's because our ticket class is missing the public keyword. And let's go back and now it's fixed, right? So let's continue with this. Uh, we also want to limit the number of characters here. So we're gonna say string length. Let's say the longest is 50, all right? Uh, let's go, let's delete this class, class one, and continue with implementing the ticket class, all right? So let's actually copy this over here and import the namespace for the validations. And let's, for now, delete these validation attributes, custom validation attributes, right? And let's uh, make sure everything look correct, right? We have ticket ID and we have project ID. And the project ID is uh, required. And we also want to limit the, the length of the title. Let's change it to 100. And the owner, so the description will have no limitation because it should accept very long strings. And for the owner, let's limit the string length to be 50. And another thing I want to change is this enter date. Let's call it report date, right? Because the enter date seems to be referring to, you know, when you enter the state, but the report date can be actually earlier than the time you entered. So I'm actually referring, really referring to uh, the date when the ticket was reported. And I think that's more important than the date when it was entered, right? So, and, and let's add some navigation properties here as well. So one ticket will be associated with a one project. Right? So let's add that. It's going to be project and then project, right? And what we need to do here is to delete this folder altogether. All right. Another thing, since we are refactoring, uh, I wanted to change this Web API to Web API to make it more intuitive so that we know this is a Web API project. And also I want to change the corresponding folder as well. So I'm going to right click on the solution and then I'm going to open folder. And uh, what I need to do is I first need to close the solution and close Visual Studio so that when I change the folder name, it would it would not complain. All right. So as you can see, the project's already changed the name, but the folder name still remains as platform demo. So I'm gonna change the folder name to match the project name. And then uh it's going to have some issues with the solution file. So I'm going to open the solution file right here. And then I'm going to change this platform to Web API, right? So this represents the folder. I changed the folder name. So I have to come to the solution file and change that folder name. So after that, I'm going to open up the solution with Visual Studio 2019 again. Everything seems to be successfully loaded. We have finished decoupling the model classes from the Web API project. In this video, we're going to talk about the second architectural problem that we're having. So if you look at under the model validations, we're having the validation attributes. All of these classes, those two classes derive from validation attributes. And the app validation attribute is part of .NET framework. And this is a problem especially when you look at this filters validation, right? So under this class derived from the action filters and action filter is part of MVC. So this is a problem, both this validation attribute as well as the, uh, the action filter that is used for validation is having a similar problem. And that problem is that we're coupling our application or business logic with the technologies itself. And the problem with that is that one day, if you want to switch technologies, you would have to rewrite all of that, 
right? So best way to capture the um, business logic or application logic is to use plain C sharp classes, just so so that no matter which technology we're gonna use, no matter how the technology improves year after year, our validations doesn't have to change just because of the technology gets improved, the technology changes. I have seen this happen very often throughout my career as a software developer. Of course, I have made countless of mistakes and especially in front-end frameworks. Um, we have Angular, React, all of those ones are improving very quickly, like changing really quickly, in introducing new concepts, new patterns of doing things. And if you were to uh, couple all of your logic into those specific te technologies that changes very often, then you end up rewriting them very often as well. Otherwise, you would wait till those technology outdated. So whenever you want to improve the technology, then you, you end up rewriting them. So having experienced all of that, I've come to the conclusion that it's best to capture your logic with plain C sharp in this case, right? So if you're using different languages, of course, you, you should use those plain programming elements like classes to capture the logic in your own language. In this video, let's decouple the validation logic from the technologies or the frameworks that we're using. The different ways to implement the validation logic. So this time around, I want to implement the validation logic within the classes. Okay? And another way to implement it is to use the, the service classes, like validation service. Right? The pros and cons of doing those things, and those pros and cons are outside of the scope of this course. Otherwise, I would be end up talking about architecture and design patterns all the time. Okay, so let's start implementing the validation logic within the model classes. The project itself really doesn't have much validation, right? So the main validation is really within the ticket, right? So the, the first one, uh, we are going to, to need is to validate whether the due date is in the future or not when ticket is is being created right so we can have this uh, validate future due date right and then this is what we are trying to do we are trying to say when creating a ticket, if due date is entered, right, it has to be in the future. Right? The due date is not required, but if but if when creating a ticket, the due date is present, then we have to make sure that it's in the future. Right? So it would be like if the ticket ID ticket ID uh has value, right? That means we don't really care. The ticket ID has values, that means it's, we're not creating the ticket. So we, we, are, we don't really care. So that's that's why we return true directly, right? And if due date is not there, then we return true right away as well. And otherwise, we will only return true if due date is in the future. Okay, so that's the first validation. And the second validation is uh, we're validating report date is present. And when an owner is assigned, the report date has to be present. So that's the logic, right? So we're gonna say validate report date presence and uh, the comment, we're adding a comment just so that we uh, we know what it's really doing. So and say when owner is assigned to the ticket, the report date has to be present. And we're gonna say, we're gonna test whether the owner is there or not, right? So if the owner 
if the owner is uh, is not there, well, typo, if the owner is not there, then we return true right away. Otherwise, uh, we're gonna return report date has value. So if report it has value, then yeah, it's there. Otherwise, uh, it's false, right? And then the third one, we are going to validate when the owner is assigned, uh, sorry, the third one is, again, when the owner is assigned, the due date also has to be present, right? We want that as well. So we can just uh, basically copy this and then change to due date. When is there, the due date has to be present. And we can say due date presence. And change this to due date. And the last one is when the due date and report date are present, the due date has to be after or equal to the report date. It, you cannot do before the ticket is even reported. So we are going to say validate uh, due date after report date. And then we add some comments here. Say when due date and report date are present, due date has to be uh, later or or uh, I don't know my English is correct here doesn't seem to be right but you get what I mean <laughs> so I'm gonna say if due date has value um, yeah if due date doesn't have value or if report date does not have value then return true right if both are present then we're going to return true if due date uh, dot date, the date part. We don't care about the minute and seconds. Uh, so if the date part is greater than the report date, then that's when it's true. So we have implemented our validation, but we need to apply to over here. And that's when we want to use the framework. We need the help with the framework, right? Uh, just like we're using these to decorate our class. Although here's a little bit slight coupling here, but we have our logic implemented in plain C sharp classes, right? So um, in order to use this, we can still use the validation attribute. And for that, I'm going to create a folder and I'm going to call it uh, validation attributes type over here attributes and because I have four validations right so that's why I'm going to create uh, four different validation attributes and each one of them is going to be a class that derives from the validation attribute and Again, I'm going to start with ticket. I'm going to say ensure. Uh, what is the first one? The first one is ensure future date. Okay. You're going to say ticket ensure future due date. Uh, due date on creation. On, cre on creating the ticket, right? And this is a, uh, then I call, let's call it attribute. And then this derived from validation attribute and do a control dot to import the namespace and then we're going to override this uh, it's going to going to use the second one just as before and the first thing we're going to do is let's go and copy some of this so we need to get the the ticket here right all right and then import the namespace the models and what we're gonna do is if take it rather the future date if this is false if this is not valid then we are going to uh, return the validation results right and I'm gonna say due date has to be in the future otherwise we are going to 
So this is a method. Otherwise, we're going to return validation result dot success. And the second one is the second validation is to validate report day presence. You know what? I'm just going to copy this, and which is going to say uh, ensure uh, report date present attribute, and I'm going to copy this. So take an ensure report date present attribute okay and here instead of calling this so it's going to be very simple we just switch to different method so report date has to be present and we need to change this and say uh, report date is required of course this is when the owner is present right and then we are going to do the third one which is to first, second, third. So the third one is a uh, due date present, right? So this report date present, I'm gonna copy that. Uh, I'm going to change to due day present. And then I'm gonna change this to due day present. And we just need to call a different method here, due day presence, and then change the message to due date is required. And the last but not least is due date after, after the report date. And for that, uh, again, we're gonna copy and paste, and then we're gonna say ensure due date after report date, and then change this validation method, validate due date after report date. And we we'll have to say that due date has to be after the, uh, report date and so after we have all of that we can just um, apply these validations right so this is report date present so this one ensure report date. so this one is going to be on the report date right and i'm going to do a control dot to import the namespace and then you're going to see this it's saying that you don't need the attribute right because C sharp uh, .NET framework will be able to recognize this, and after I delete the attribute, you know I can. This is still this is not complaining, right? So we can do that, and then the rest we can apply. So each one of the other ones uh, are related to the due date, more related to the due date than uh, than the report date. So I am going to apply those ones here. All right, so. We applied the logic and then we can clean up these ones, the versions. I'm going to talk about the versions later so we can delete all of that and we can delete the model validations as well. And because we deleted that, uh, the versions resource filter. So we have to clean up here as well as deleting the namespace and let's build and see whether the solution builds or not. Something is wrong. Okay, some cleaning up is needed. These ones as well. Uh, the ticket, we are going to reference. Add a project reference to the core library. And then we're going to import a namespace. And we are going to delete uh, version 2. We're going to clean up this as well we're going to clean up this later let's see whether this solution builds all right the solution builds and let's give it a quick test i'm doing control f5 and it is running over here uh, i'm going to go to postman and we're posting to create tickets and the first one is if the due date is uh when we are creating ticket uh, the due date, if the due date is present, it has to be in the future. So if let's change it to in the past and see whether we're having problems. Okay, so we are having the, uh, we're seeing this issue and it says the due date has to be in the future and report date is also required. So that's because the owner is there, right? So if we remove the owner, then it's going to say only the due date has to be in the future. 
and if we fix this to be in the future, then no problem, right? And the second one is uh, we have already tested it. when the owner is there, right? The owner is there, then the report date has, uh, has to be there as well. So uh, we can add the report date and the report date we're gonna say uh, it's going to be earlier than the due date in that case uh, no problem anymore but if we are if we are to, if we were to change that to be later than the due date then the due date has to be after the report date okay uh, just wanted to point out one thing. I don't remember whether I have pointed that out. So you see that we are not testing the model state, right? We are not coming over here and saying, hey, if the model state is invalid, right? Uh, that's, we are not doing that. We didn't have to do this. The model validation happens automatically uh, within the filter pipeline. That's because we're using the API controller. That's the fact of using the API controller attribute here. All right, so that's, uh, that's our test and everything seems to still work. Okay, so that's how I separated the validation logic from the web API project and also uh, decoupled them, right? It decoupled the logic from the technology. Of course, like I said, we're still using the uh, system dot component model dot data annotations, uh, but we're just using it, right? Our logic is inside the plain C sharp class, and also this system dot component model dot data annotations is not part of Web API, right? So we can actually rely on this without rely on, relying on uh, any other frameworks, application frameworks. We're merely just depending on the .NET framework. Because eventually our model objects will be saved in data store, right? These model classes are used to communicate between uh, our web API and the data store. In order to talk to the database, we're gonna use entity framework in this course. And let's start by creating a class library. So we're adding a project and we're gonna choose class library .NET standard. Again, we're gonna upgrade to .NET 5 later. For now, let's use .NET standard to mimic the real world scenario where you have a project, most likely you uh, in your workplace, you have a lot of a class libraries that is created with a framework or a standard. So we need to upgrade them later. So let's do that. Let's choose a standard for now. And then um, let's call it uh, data store dot NED framework. All right. So we have, uh, we first, first thing first, we need to add a dependency package, a new get package to entity framework core. So I'm gonna add the package from the from here and I'm gonna search entity and we're gonna see the first thing is the entity framework core. And so instead of using 501, I'm gonna use 3110. Just like I said, I'm gonna mimic the scenario where later we have to upgrade that. Click on I accept, and then let's check the dependency packages are correctly installed. And then now um, let's, uh, let's change this to our, to DB context, and then we're gonna call it box context, right? And this context will derive from the DB context. And this comes from the entity framework core uh, package. And so I did a control dot to import the namespace. And later, now we are going to 
and create a uh, constructor with DB context options. And these options can be used to initialize, to configure the box context. And we simply just use the base class uh, constructor to configure the box context, right? So that's the first step. We're just passing the options to DB context and the options we can configure that in the startup.cs later. But for now, uh, let's continue with setting up the box context. So although this course is not about entity framework, uh, I wanted to cover the essential part of the entity framework in this video. So the context really represents the database in memory, right? Because this is ORM, which is going to load the data and represents the whole schema in memory. And just and because of that, we need to kind of uh, have a mapping between the memory and the the actual tables in the database, right? So this represents database itself. Then we need to have the members that corresponds to the tables. And for that, we can just use simple properties. And each DB set here corresponds to a table. So we have project, right? So this is going to be corresponding to the projects table. And then next one is another DB set, which corresponds to the ticket table. And we're going to call it tickets. And we need to import the namespace, of course. And of course, we need to add a reference. Uh, this way of adding reference is very slow. So let's uh, go to dependency, right click on it, add the product reference to the core, and then click on OK. And then I come over here and do control dot to import the namespace. Now I stop complaining. And after having these properties that correspond to the tables, we need to configure the, the database schema, right? The relationships between uh, the, the tables, between the tables, these two. And to do that, we can override. Remember, we are, we are deriving from a DB context. So there's, there's things that we can override. And what we are going to override is this on model creating. And this on model creating it means that uh, when, when this is called, we are creating a schema within the memory, right? That represents the database schema, the entities and the relationships, or the tables and the relationships in the data store. We're having that, that same relationship re re represented in memory. And this is the place, this method is the place where we configure that schema and all of the table relationships here. And what, can, what we can do is to use this model builder. We can say model builder dot entity. So we're con configuring project, right? And we can say uh, this project has many, has many, we can say have key, uh, but Entity framework uses conventions like project ID will be matched, will be, will be considered as, as the primary key, right? Same as the ticket ID here, right? So you, you would have to call it either ID or ticket ID, right? And here you have to call it either ID or project ID, then will automatically be considered as primary key. And it will be uh, identity since you're using integer. So there's some convention there. Right, so going back to the box context here, uh, we just we don't need to say has key, but we can say has many, right? So project has many tickets, right? And tickets in turn has has one a uh, project, right? And also in the in the uh, ticket table, it has foreign key. And what is the foreign key? And that foreign key is the project ID. And then uh, after that, so this relationship is, is created. After that, what we can do is to seed 
the initial data. So we're doing data seeding, right? Just added some test data there so that we don't end up with a, with a empty database. So again, we can use model builder to do that. We can say, uh, we're gonna populate the project table, right? And the project has initial data. And this data, you can see that it's a array of objects, right? Of course, it's gonna be an array. In this case, it will be an array of, um, of project, right? So I'm gonna say project ID is one and name is going to be one. So um, you may be having questions regarding the project ID because we are specifying the ID here. Uh, and uh, you're wondering why we're specifying because if it's identity column, it needs to be automatically generated. But uh, when we are seeding the data, that the identity thing is turned off, right? So it's going to not going to use identity when we're seeding data. So we can just create project one and project two. And after that, uh, we are going to, again, uh, create some ticket, model builder dot entity and uh, ticket. And then again, has data. And then um, here we're having a problem, just delete that. And then we can just uh, have a array of ticket. And here again, we're setting the uh, ID title is required. So we'll just say bug number one. And then this belong to the, um, the first project, right? And let's have, let's have three. So this is gonna be belong to the first project and then this let's assign it to the second project. And then I'm gonna have uh, to change these numbers. And that's it. All right. Okay. So now let's go to the web API startup.cs. This, this is SPDNA core. And we are going to use an in memory database if we are in development, right? If we're in development uh, environment, we're going to use an in memory database. So for that, we are going to add a dependency here. It's going to be, uh, we're gonna search entity in memory. Let's see whether we can find one. So it's this one. And again, we're gonna choose a lower version for now. We'll accept, and it's complaining about something. Okay, it's complaining about this. But let's check whether sometimes it doesn't, uh, if there's an error, it's going to fail to install, but in this case, it's installed already, All right? So we can come over here. And we're going to configure the dependency injection in the configure services. Uh, we are going to say services. I'm going to add a DB context, add DB context, and we're going to add the box context. And of course, for that, we need to add a project dependency, right? And that's going to be entity framework, right? So, and, um, uh, and here we are configuring the options and uh, the options in this case is going to be use in memory database uppercase and then i'm doing control dot import namespace right so we call this uh, our database box and this options here this configuration options is going to be passed into here, into the constructor, and then goes into the constructor of DB context base class, right? That's when the dependency injection is triggered uh, when this class is required and needs to be created. Then Donna Core is gonna create this box context class passing in the options into the constructor that we specified here. And then it goes into the constructor of the DB context class. But this is a in-memory database. But like I said, we 
wanted to be use uh, to be using in-memory database only during development. So how do we how do we do something like this? Environment is development. Uh, it in, inside here the environment comes from the variable, but here how do we how do we do that? Well, we can use a constructor, ctor, and then we can inject this from here, right? So I'm gonna just do control dot, and then uh, I'm going to do this. My Visual Studio is not configured to have the underscore for a private field. So I'm just going to uh, manually add it. So what's this? I can just call it here, and I'm gonna say if um, right environment is development, then I'm going to use the in-memory database. And then later, we're going to use SQL Server. All right, but for now, uh, let's just do, do this here. And But with, with in-memory database, every time when it starts, it has to create a database in the memory, right? And that has, we have to have a, a uh, we have to have a reference to the context to the box context. And since we have dependency injected in the configure services, now we can inject that into the configure, configure method by just doing box context and just have the context here. Then we can use it directly here. And again, if the environment is development environment, then we're gonna create the in memory uh, database right for dev environment so what we can do is we can say context.database dot ensure uh, first we can do ensure deleted probably not necessary but just in case we can do ensure deleted and then we can say context.database ensure created right and that's it for now later we can deal with SQL Server. All right, let's build the solution and see whether everything builds. Everything still builds. Okay, so we have just added Entity Framework Core to the project, to the solution. And let's sum up. There's actually a few steps that we needed to do. First, we added the a separate class library and it's done at standard 2.0. And the reason why I wanted to create a separate data store.yf class library to have all of, uh, to have everything related to entity framework inside that class library is because you see the entity framework is ORM and it deals with all of the things that are related to connecting to database by using entity framework technology. Well, I don't want to mix that technology with Web API project because it's a separate technology. I want it to be decoupled. And I don't want to mix that technology into the core uh, library either because core is supposed to be plain, plainer than anything else. It's not supposed to be dependent or related or coupled with any specific technology. And that's the reason I created a separate library for it. And then we added a package that is entity framework core. And then we added the box context deriving from DB context. Then we added the corresponding tables, a okay, quote unquote, quote unquote tables, right? And each data set, DB set represents a table. And then we overwrote the on model creating. So this method creates the schema inside the memory. And then when you run migrate, when you create migrations and run the migrations, the schema is going to be created inside the database, provided we're using a SQL server. Uh, and then we, you know, we added the relationship, the schema between different entities. And we also seeded the data. Then after that, we went to our web API, added the in-memory package, and then we configured our uh, 
DB context in the configure configure services method, we added the box context as a dependency injection, and um, and then uh, we also configured the creation of the in-memory database right here. There's something I wanted to add is if we look at this method here, uh, there is a default, the service lifetime, right? The default lifetime time for the dependency injection in this case is scoped. Scope means that each time a HTTP request is sent to our SP.NET Core, in this case, it's the Web API application, a new instance of box contacts will be created. But that instance will be the same instance for the entire uh, request and response cycle, right? So the first the request comes in and then, so let's see whether we have that picture still here, right? So we have uh, our service listening to the port. So the request comes in and then the remotely hosted methods uh, process the request right and does the data manipulation and then response would come back i didn't draw that but the response would come back right so this request request and response cycle is is one uh, cycle so this for this entire one cycle there's going to be only one box context right that's what it means by scope by uh, scoped life time scoped lifetime i just want to clarify that all right now that we hooked up entity framework core we can use the entity framework core to create the endpoints to actually pull the data from our controllers in this video let's work on the project's controller with the entity framework core so first let's go to our project's controller and first thing first is that we need to have an instance of the DB context, right? The box context. And here comes another argument that usually people make about whether or not to use entity framework directly within the controllers. My personal take about this is that if we are using Web API to share and manipulate data directly instead of using web api to share business um, to share business logic then it is okay to use the db context directly within the controller right after all the db context it hides the details of connecting to database having said that if we were to use this uh, use web api to wrap around the business logic layer i mean the uh, if we call it use case layer or the application logic layer, then I would actually create a repository layer and wrap around entity framework so that we can have the repository layer work as a plugin and plug it into uh, the core of our application. Now, and don't worry if you're not sure what I'm talking about. I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the architecture uh, later when we work on the, the front end part. All right. So first, we need to dependency inject the DB context into our controller. Let's go to startup and take a look at again that we have this dependency injection right here, right? This is the extension method. You can see this is extension method. Inside this extension method, the DB context, the box context is injected into entity framework core. So with that already injected, I mean configured to be injected. Now inside here, if we just say bugs context, Right, and then we can call it, since this represents a database, so we can just call it DB. And then I am going to uh, do control dot to import a namespace. And then I'm gonna do control dot again and choose the second option to create a local private variable. And then here, we're going to start working on each and every one of 
these endpoints, right? These action methods. And what we can do here directly is we can just do db dot projects dot to list. This to list forces the query to immediately execute and return all of the projects back, right? So this is the first one. And then the second one, this is where we need to do a little bit more work than the first one. We need to first find the project with the ID, right? And if we can't find it, then we cannot return OK. So we have to do that kind of testing there. So, so I'm going to say project equals db projects, right? And then we can do find. And you can see that the find, what it does do is it finds the entity with the given primary key values, right? So here we need to provide the primary key, which is the project ID. And this is the ID that corresponds to that project ID. So then now we can test if it's now or not. If it is now, we're returning instead of OK, of course we can't return OK, we can return not found. And this is going to be HTTP 404. So yeah, so this not found, just like OK, uh, it's a helper function that we can we can call, right? You can see that this is a, a function that comes from controller base. And because we're deriving from the controller base, so we can use that uh, to return the HTTP 404. And if we reach this point, that means we have a project and we can just return HTTP 200. Nothing is wrong, we're returning the project back. All right, the next one, get the project tickets. So let's fix this. It's called get project ticket. So let's add a, make it plural. And then we are not gonna have the second ticket number, ticket ID, right? And we don't need this. Our path, we will still have to use the route to override this because this is not in the pattern of API slash projects, right? This controller uh, template represents this project. So yeah, this is a different pattern. So that's why we are using this route. And then uh, we are not going to need this logic anymore, right? What we can do here is we can um, look for the tickets directly. So we can just say tickets equals db dot tickets dot where, where we can't use find anymore. Uh, because that was looking to use a, prim a primary key. This is a foreign key. So we're looking for PID, right? And then we can just execute the query immediately by calling to list. And then we can say, we can try to tell whether there is the tickets returned, right? Um, the swear clause is returning a I queryable. So even when there is no tickets, it's most likely not going to be null. It's not going to be null, right? So, but in case we just cover all the possibilities we use with testing whether it's null, most likely when there's no tickets, uh, it's going to be the count will be uh, zero. And, but we're using less or equal to zero just to make sure that we cover all the cases, right? In this case, still not found. And if the code reaches here, that means we have the tickets. All right, now we are working on the creating endpoint, which is the post. And for that, we need to have our project to be entered into the post method. And this comes from the body. We don't have to say it, but we can be specific and just say, oh, this comes from the body. Right. If we don't say it, it's going to look for the project from five different places that we talked about and when we talked about model binding. So we can specifically say that this comes from the body because usually when we post, the data comes from body. And then here, we can still use Entity Framework. And it's actually pretty easy. We're just adding 
uh, the project into project. And then here we can call save changes. So since this is a project, when it's adds into the DB context, right? The DB context, what's gonna happen is entity framework has a thing that is called change tracker, right? It has the change tracking mechanism where when you add this project into the DB context, it's gonna mark this project as added. So there is the change tracker has a state. Uh, it's going to track the state of each object. And this uh, object has added state and uh, each object has different states like added, modified, deleted, unchanged, detached, uh, things like that. Right. So in this case, we're adding a new project into the DB context because this is new. So it's going to be marked as added. And when we call DB context save change, it's going to check the state of the object and it sees that, okay, so this project is a uh, added, a new project is going to generate a different database operation, right? It's going to generate the insert uh, statement into a uh, SQL server if we were dealing with SQL server, right? And other projects, other existing projects, uh, because they have the unchanged state, so the save changes statement will do nothing. We'll do nothing with them. So what's more interesting here is like, it seems simple, but uh, what should we return, right? We can choose to return either the ID or the created object. What was uh, usually a great upon by developers is that here we should return the inserted object. So once the save changes statement is executed, the project will gain an ID, right? The project ID will be populated. So then we have a complete object and we can return that object back to the caller. And here we can use a, a helper method which is the created at action. And uh, this created at action is going to return HTTP code 201 created. So with the helper function here, uh, it's going to return that HTTP code. And uh, you can see this is action name. So this action name, the name of the action to use to generate the URL. So it's going to generate a URL that's going, going to be given to the caller to know which URL to follow to find the created object. So this, uh, the first parameter is going to be the action name, right? So this is an action, action method, right? The action name of this method. So we can use name of get by, uh, get by ID. So that's the first one. And then we can use another, we can use the second one. So this one gives the rot, right? So which means that get, because get by ID has a raw parameter. So let's provide that raw parameter um, by using dynamic object, which is the generated project ID. And then the third one is the, the whole, the complete project object itself. And then we we're done, right? And then when we're testing, we can see what the effect of this created at action. All right, now we're moving on to put. So for the put method, we can just have the project passed in just like a uh, post. We can have it passing from the body, but it's usually done when, with the ID itself passed in so that we can add an extra uh, validation here and, you know, we, we got to make sure that the ID is the same as this ID. And sometimes if you forget to pass in the ID, then it has to fail, right? And because of this um, ID here, we wanted to go through the raw as well, uh, right? So, so we provide a raw parameter like this. And then um, here, first thing first, we need to make sure that they are the same, this ID, and the project ID itself is the same. Otherwise, it's going to return 
bad request, right? So this is going to be HTTP 400. Uh, and now, um, since this is HTTP per put, this is not HTTP patch, and plus we don't know which uh, property has changed. What we can do with the DB context here is we can say entry. And as you can see, this scans the access to the entity where you can change the state of the change tracker. Right, so we can say, hey, this uh, object within the DB context, its state is supposed to be, um, so there is a entity state. Uh, there is, so we're gonna import a namespace here, entity framework core, and we set it to be modified, right? So we're basically directly telling entity framework that this project that you already have, is modified uh, and then we can save the changes like this and usually what's agreed upon by most developers that for the update statement uh, we are return no content if everything succeeded so we can return no content that there is another possibility what happens before the db save changes is executed the project is already deleted it's gone from the database Right, so we need to process, we specifically process that scenario. We can check the existence of the project object before the save changes, but that doesn't guarantee that between that checking and the save changes, there isn't a chance of deleting that object from the database. Right, so best way to do it is to do a try catch. So basically, if the save changes is if the save changes is executed and it failed, and it can fail for different reasons, right? For most reasons, we can just throw the exceptions out again, and it will generate, in this case, it will generate a HTTP 500, meaning server error, right? And then we'll have all of the information within that HTTP response. But we want to specifically handle the scenario where the project is already deleted just before the save changes statement is executed. So what we can do is we can use projects and we can try to find the ID. And if it is now, if we can't find it, that means it's already gone, then we can say not found, right? HTTP not found. So last but not least, we're working on delete HTTP verb. So we're deleting a project. On uh, this one, depending on your requirement, you may not want to actually delete it from the database. So you can kind of implement an update, a soft delete, right? So we, if we add a is active field to the project object, then we can mark that as uh, deleted, but it's not actually deleted. But just for demonstration, I want to demonstrate the whole series of actions here. I want to actually delete the project. But like I said, most uh, production environment, you don't want to actually delete anything. You just want to do soft delete, right? Again, we're looking for the project. And if the project cannot be found, then of course, we're going to return not found, right? And if it is actually found, then we can just remove it from the DB context, right? And again, the change tracker will mark this as uh, deleted. And then when the save changes statement is run, it's going to see, oh, this object is deleted. Then it's going to uh, generate a de uh, delete statement, SQL statement. And um, it's gonna actually delete that from the database if we are dealing with server. Uh, so here, then, what are we going to return? Um, there are different arguments. Again, most people agree that uh, we can return just the deleted object with a HTTP 200, right? HTTP OK. All right, so that's all of the broad operation. Plus, we have an extra one here. In this video, let's test all of the endpoints that we have created so far and do a control F5. All right, um, so we can start with testing this get. So I've created these endpoints already. 
uh, I can try to see. Okay, so the initial seeded projects are there. If we examine our entity framework, the DB context seeding here, we have two projects and three bugs. The first bug, first two bugs are assigned to the first project, and then the third one assigned to the the second one. Right. So we have this, and then we can try the se the second endpoint, which is get by ID. Okay. So get by ID works. Right. We get the first one. I'm gonna try the third one. Uh, third one. No, we don't have the third one. Right. So that's why it returns not found. So that's that's good. And then what is the the third endpoint, which is the get project tickets, and that is we can use this, uh, and this is API project, and then tickets, right? So we're getting the second one, right? Getting the tickets from this for the second project. So this is bug number three. And what if we use the first one? Then we have bug number one and bug number two, and and what if we put something that doesn't actually exist, right? Bug number six. And what if we put in some letters that doesn't, it's not a number, right? So again, it's going to say bad request, right? The value ABD is not valid, right? All right, so that's that one. And then we're creating another one. So before we create another one, let's actually run this one. Uh, to verify that we have only two projects, right? And then we go here and we make sure that this is the endpoint and this is the verb. And then we go to the body, make sure the type is application JSON, right? And then we provide the name. We don't need to provide the project ID because it needs to be created uh, automatically, right? Since I was testing before let's change this to project six for example well let's just call it uh, something meaningful another project right and then i'm going to click on send so it created project id number three name is another project another thing i want to point out is that since this is a http post and corresponds to the creating project endpoint Remember we returned was the helper method create created at action, right? And that's supposed to generate a get URL that points to uh, this newly created project. And where is that URL? So if we go to headers, you can see that we have a location header and this points to, right? This has this URL that points to the newly created project. And if then we come back to get projects and run it, we can see that the third one is created with another project. And what if we create another one right here? We can say project number four, and then it's going to create this and coming back, right? So that's project. And, and the next one is an update statement. So we make sure it's put, we make sure that we have uh, the correct URL, right? Don't forget that we need to indicate the ID of the project that we we're trying to update, and as well as providing the project in the body. So same here, we go to raw and then JSON, and then we create this JSON in the body. So we're updating project number one, and we're saying that this is the first project, right? If we go back here, we can see we can see that this currently the first project is called project one. So if we update the name to be this is the first project, uh, click on this and see what happens. It says two zero four no content means it's actually updated, right? Because we're returning no content for update statement. So going back to projects and then I'm running this, you can see that. The first one is changed to this is the first project. So that means uh, it's good, we, we did it correctly. And what if I put in something that doesn't really exist, right? For example, 11, and it's gonna give us a bad request because this and this doesn't correspond. And what if 
they correspond. Uh, then you see it's going to give us an exception, right? Because it's trying to attempt it to update or delete an entity that does not exist in the store. So this is from the entity framework in memory database, right? It's looking for that one, but it doesn't really exist. Right? So, um, so it generates exception and the HTTP code is 500 internal server error, right? And last but not least, let's try the, the delete project. And because we have four, so let's delete the last one. Actually, let's delete the third one. So let's go to delete and the same rot was the number three, deleting number three. And in this here, we don't need any uh, body here. And I'm going to click on send. So it returns HTTP 200 with the deleted object, right? And if we go to get projects, run it again. Now the third project is deleted. All right, that's everything I want to cover for this video. Since we have learned using Entity Framework Core to retrieve projects, create projects, update projects and delete projects, let's practice doing the same thing with the tickets and points. So try to do that yourself before you look at the next video. Have you worked on creating the endpoints yourself? Or really try to do that yourself so that you can really hammer all of these concepts and the practice in your mind. You can remember how this works, especially the reasoning behind all of these decisions. So this is the suggested answer. Uh, of course, first you would need to create the constructor uh, in order to dependency inject the context into the controller. And that's uh, the box context. You can use DB, you can call it DB, or you can call it context, doesn't really matter. Okay. And then here we do a control dot to create an assign. And the first endpoint is the easiest one. You can just do db.tickets.toList. Remember the to list forces the execution right away. All right, the second one, we're gonna get the ticket first from a G framework. And we're gonna test whether the ticket exists or not. So when you work on this, don't just copy and paste from the project's controller, really work on that yourself and going through all of that reasoning behind it, right? So why do we do this? Right? Because we want to return uh, not found if we can't find the tickets, right? And uh, if we do, then we can put the ticket over here, right? And then we work on the post. So the post is about creating the ticket and the ticket comes from the body, right? Again, you don't have to specify that it comes from the body, but since this always comes from the body, so you can actually, to be more specific, so you can even remind yourself uh, and these from body uh, attributes can even put inside one of these because this one can come from the query string, for example, and the other ones can come from the body. Although I don't really suggest that, but it's a possibility, right? Uh, although you, if you were to do that, you would really need to create the data transfer objects, right? Because putting those attributes uh, from body attributes, this, if we do F12, we can see this comes from the MVC namespace. We don't want to associate MVC namespace with, uh, with the actual, the business entities. So use data transfer objects. If you were to put the from body, from query, et cetera, into the data, tra data transfer objects. I know I haven't talked about data transfer objects. Uh, I'm going to talk about that later. For now, if you don't understand what a data transfer object is, don't worry about it. I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, for now, you just need to remember, just don't associate anything other than uh, plain C-sharp classes or attributes or variables with the model classes. All right, so here we are going to first the tickets and add the ticket, uh, the context. And then we're gonna save, right? And do you remember 
what we need to do here. So we need to use the helper method here to generate a URI of uh, so that caller can follow this URL to get the newly created ticket. It's just a, a thing that most people do. You can definitely just return the ID of the newly created ticket because once the ticket is saved, the ticket ID will be. So this is generated. So before this is executed, the ticket ID is not there, right? But after it's saved to the database, it generates the ID. So you can definitely return just the ID, but most people use this approach. So we're going to follow the same approach. Now it's update. Update is, so update, we first of all need to provide the ID as well as the ticket object. And first we need to do that testing uh, and make sure that the ticket ID and the ID is the same. Otherwise it's a bad request. Then we are going to just use the, to modify the, the state of the change tracker. Import the namespace modified, right? So we set the state to be modified so that when we do DB save changes, it will know that it needs to generate a update statement, right? And, and the reasoning behind this, trying to remind yourself why we're doing this, right? It's because we don't really know what's changed inside the ticket object, right? That's why we're using this approach to update the whole entity, like every field of the entity. So, and to prevent the exceptions happening or to handle the, the set exceptions when, uh, the record is deleted before it's updated. That's why we're trying to use the track catch. And then what we are trying to do here is to, to see whether this ticket still exists or not, right? So we got exception and then we're trying to test whether the ticket exists or not. If not, then you know, we don't really have this ticket anymore. So we're returning this uh, if it's a different type of exception. Then we just throw the exception out and then it will cause a HTTP 500 internal server error. And if everything is uh, successful, though we just, then we just return mm -hmm. HTTP no content. Last but not least, uh, we're handling the delete. Again, you may just want to do a soft delete, but we want to do hard delete just because we want to go through the whole CRUD operations. Right, so we find the ticket and we're trying to see whether the ticket is empty or not. If it's not empty, then, sorry, if it's empty, then we return not found, right? You can't delete something that doesn't exist, right? That's the first test. And then we're gonna go into the context and we're just going to remove, uh, remove this. We're gonna, and then we're gonna remove this ticket, right? And then we're gonna do save changes and it will generate a delete statement. So this remove uh, method here, it changes the change tracker, right? The state of the change tracker, it marks at deleted. Then when you uh, do the save changes, then it will generate a delete statement, SQL Server, if you're using SQL Server, right? And the convention here is that it's going to return the deleted uh, ticket. Okay, in this video, we're going to test the ticket endpoint and do a build and then I'm going to do a control I five. All right. So that runs and we're going to launch Postman. Let's go to our web API course folder and let's take a look at our create ticket uh, endpoint. Let's change this to get. Okay. So we're hitting this correct endpoint and we don't have any body. We have just content type header, which is okay and rename this as get, get ticket, and then send a request and see whether we have some tickets. Yes, so these are the seeded tickets. All right, so that's the get. And what about the second endpoint where we can uh, just get the ticket by ID? So we're getting the first one, which is correct, and let's get the, the last one, and that works. All right, so, then we're gonna duplicate this get ticket 
entry here. We're going to change this to a uh, post and we are going to go to the body. Make sure this is application JSON and thus what we are having is a this is not a ticket. This is is this a ticket? Yeah, this is a ticket and let's see what's going to happen here if we put 100 because we don't have project 100 right and let's say this is my 100th bug this bug is not obvious um and we don't have an owner we don't have report date we don't have any of these okay and let's send this let's actually save this first and then let's send this and we generated this which is incorrect, right? We're not supposed to create a ticket uh, when we don't even have the project, right? So let's take a look at what projects we have. We only have two projects, I remember. All right, so we're missing. Um, let's rename this first, make sure it's correct. We're creating ticket. Actually, the reason why we're seeing this, that we are able to create a ticket against a project that doesn't exist and that's because we are not working with a relational database, right? So if we go back and take a look at the, the, the way that we configure the schema, we actually has a foreign key here, but this foreign key did not actually work. And the reason is, is that we are working with the in-memory database, right? So if we are going to work with SQL Server here, you're going to see uh, a internal error, internal server error, HTTP 500, right? But uh, just because we're working with an in-memory database, that's why we're having this issue. Later, we're going to hook up to SQL Server, and then if you want to test, you can test yourself. That's not going to throw this error. However, if you do want to handle this uh, by creating a, a validation attribute, you can definitely do so. Right? Um, by doing that, you can provide some very nice uh, error message uh, if you want to. So if you want to do that that's going to be a additional practice for you to do i'm not going to give you the answer for that uh, i think i already have four different uh, validation attributes you can definitely follow those examples to create a another validation to make sure that the foreign key constraint is there so um, let's skip that part don't worry about that but in this time, we are actually going to, uh, let's see what projects do we have? We have two projects. Okay, so let's uh, create, let's create another project here, right? So project three, and then let's create a ticket against number three, right? So this is gonna be the third. Okay, so we create it and ticket ID is five, project ID is number three. And if we go to this endpoint, where we can provide project three, we see all of the tickets belong to project three, uh, then we have this, right? And if we are trying to create another one against uh, the third project, um, then we can do so. And uh, this is a success. Going back here, run this again to get all of the tickets belong to project number three, we should have two. And that's exactly what we're having, right? So now let's test the uh, update operation here. So we did creation, we did read, uh, we did read, we did creating. Uh, let's update a ticket. And let's duplicate this one and change the name. Uh, let's call it update ticket and we are going to update, uh, let's get all of the tickets again. Let's actually rename this to get tickets. Okay, and let's get all of the tickets. And we have, the last one is number six, right? And it says this is the fourth bug. Uh, let's change this to, this is the sixth bug, right? So let's go over here and then change this to put, right? A put corresponds to update. And we also need to provide the ID. All right, so we're going to uh, update ticket, 
ID number six, let's call it, and project ID number three. And we are going to say this is the, the six bug, right? And then let's see whether we're gonna have an a error or kind of uh, an unexpected behavior here. All right, so we received 405 method not allowed. Why is that? Let's go to here to our tickets and points and let's see whether we can see any issues. Do you see any problem? Okay, where does this ID come in? Right, we didn't provide this rot template, template, right? This rot parameter template here. So we can just put the ID here and then you know build this project or right, building completed and let's do this again. All right, so we're receiving a error here. We're saying the error says uh, one or more validation failed, ticket ID is invalid after a value expected either comma or whatever, whatever. Ticket ID is invalid. Oh, that's because, that's because here, this ID is supposed to be the same as this. But that's interesting. If the ID is not equal to this ID is supposed to return bad request. Did we get a bad request? Oh, we did. We did get a bad request. So this ID and this ID has to correspond. And okay, yeah, we didn't provide a comma. Right, so that that's a, a wrong. So if we have a different ID, it shouldn't have this issue. It should be a, yeah, it should be just like that, right? And that's now let's change it back to six. And now we should, because we forgot to put a comma here. Now we hit the send button and we're saying it, then it's saying attempt to update and delete an entity that doesn't exist. We don't have ticket ID number six, do have ticket ID number six, but the project ID is two, right? And that's why. So we got to change this to number two and then fire this command again, and it's still complaining. So let's run this. Do we have ticket number six? We don't have number six. We have number three and project. Okay, so we didn't, we didn't have that. So we have to do this. Ticket number three, project number two, we do send. Now it says two or four, no content. So now it's successfully updated, uh, however, this is a wrong number, but that's fine. We can use that to, to do a, a test. I think some, uh, at some point I shut down the service. That's why everything restarted. So we lost third project and those tickets that we created. That's the reason. So let's, uh, let's see whether we have updated the third one. Now the third one says bug number three and let's see whether we have changed that. Yeah, we have changed title successfully to the sixth bug. Right, and then description, we also added, uh, changed the description. All right, and of course, it's going to have all those existing validations that we already had, right? For example, this one is gonna cause some issue. Here is gonna say due date is required. The, those are the custom validation attributes. Due date earlier than today, then it's gonna say report date is also required. Okay, so. It's not checking that first, it's going to, ch it's checking report date. And let's get the report date as well. Okay, report date is fine to be earlier. Uh, now it says no content. Okay, yeah, due date, because we are updating. That's why due date can be, uh, due date is allowed to be in the past, right? Whereas if we are creating this, we're creating this. So remove this, we're creating this, then it's going to complain that one or more valid due date has to be in the future, right? And if we change it to be next year, which is just a couple of days later, uh, then we're having a correct ticket created. Now if we go to get tickets, then we should get a additional ticket, which is ID number four. All right, and the last one is going to be delete. And let's duplicate this endpoint instead, moving that down over here and I do a control E to modify the name. Let's change that to tickets over here and let's delete the first, then do a save and do a send. 
So the first ticket is deleted and return the whole thing because it should be 200 here. Then we can go back to get tickets and give it a test. All right, so we don't see the first ticket anymore. Everything is tested, everything is working. Congratulations, you have reached the end of this course. To get the complete course, uh, follow the links below. The com complete course will have uh, a lot of other information, including advanced web API topics, as well as using Blazor WebAssembly to consume the web API that we have built so far. And uh, we'll dig really deep into authentication authorization, both for web API and uh, Blazor WebAssembly. I hope I'll see you in the complete course. Please check out the links below. And also for the source code, please check out the links below.